got a big head. Look at that. So I'm leaning forward. <laughs> if I see it from all the way back here, <laughs> my head is normal now, size like yours. Now you look like that guy in Men in Black whose head's you growing see back. This? <laughs> Johnny Cash, Men in Black. <laughs> Tick tock, time to rock. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, or good afternoon, or good morning, wherever you are in the world. Um, I'm here with Anthony. Anthony's actually at my house because we are recording a series on the Trinity in the Old Testament. So uh, Anthony put together a series. We're going through those. We're going to edit those, have those up. And uh, so it's kind of arranged by, um, instead of his longer lectures on the topic, will be some short videos as part of a series. So Anthony... Yes. Well, I start checking these comments, why would the topic of the Trinity in the Old Testament be important? Well, obviously, every Christian should be interested in all that God has to say about himself. So if for no other reason than that the Old Testament uh, is the beginning of how God uh, starts revealing himself, uh, we should take an interest in it. As Christians, we serve a God of truth, and so all truth that he reveals about himself uh, should be of concern to us. But in addition to that, as Christians, we believe that Scripture, and one of the evidences of Scripture, is its own consistency. And seeing the Trinity in the Old Testament, not simply in the New, is another example of its internal consistency. Uh, but perhaps most significantly relevant to apologetics is many people believe that if the Trinity is not revealed in the Old Testament, then it undermines the New Testament witness to the Trinity, if, if they believe the New Testament teaches the Trinity at all. For Jews, this becomes the grounds for completely rejecting the New Testament witness, the, the claims of Christ and uh, the apostolic proclamation of the gospel. Uh, and for Muslims, it becomes grounds for saying, well, either the New Testament must be reinterpreted to uh, agree with the allegedly Unitarian character of the Old Testament, or we have to say that it's been corrupted. And so uh, Muslims use the idea that the Old Testament is Unitarian as a way of uh, manipulating how one approaches the New Testament or uh, predetermining how they, they accept or reject it. Uh, and, and so that for those sorts of reasons, this, this topic is, is really important. Um, one quick question here before we, uh, you start going through some material. This is from Harrison. Harrison says, what's the best book on the subject of the Trinity? I don't know if you would narrow it down to one, but I'm sure you have some ideas. Yeah, yeah. I guess it depends uh, a lot on if, if you're thinking of focusing on something in particular. If you're looking for something uh, that systematizes what the Bible teaches about the Trinity, then you can't do much better than a good systematic theology, uh, like Burkhoff's systematic theology, Raymond's systematic theology. There are numerous systematic theologies out there that are really good, and that gives you not only passages that establish the doctrine, but also discusses how these things all relate and tie together. Uh, but if you're looking for exegetical type stuff, this this would be, uh, you know, there would be different books that would be very helpful. Uh, but I would recommend, I, I contributed to a book called Our God is Triune, uh, it was edited by Michael Burgoss, and that has a lot of good articles uh, in it, different contributors. Uh, Vocab Malone was a contributor. Eddie Dalcor was a contributor. Hiram Diaz, Michael Burgoss. Uh, so I, I think that book is very useful, uh, but there, that's not the only book on the market uh, by any stretch that, that looks at good exegetical evidence for the Trinity. Uh, Robert Morey's book is still a great classic, uh, The Trinity, Evidence and Issues. Uh, Dr. White has a book on the Trinity that's very popular. Uh, his book, The Forgotten Trinity, uh, is very good. So there are a lot of good books out there. It just a lot depends on <coughs> what you want to focus on. As far as Old Testament evidence for the Trinity, though, I don't think you'll do much better than the book I helped uh, uh, author. And not, not just because of my contribution. You're a little far back. Put your whole chair up. Oh, all right. <clears throat> All right, so that that's uh, that's your position on the best book. It was a very simple question. One book. <laughs> well, there, there's a lot of good books. A lot of good books. Mm -hmm. Maury's book, Trinity: Evidence and Issues. Doctor White's book, Forgotten Trinity. Uh, Our God is Triune, edited by Michael Burgoss. Uh, Fred Sanders has a good book on the Trinity. Uh, all of these books, though, 
are, are valuable for different reasons. And I think that a, a multiplicity of books is recommended on this topic because there's, there's so much there and, uh, you know, this, this helps you get it from every angle. Mm -hmm. Um, Jabari says, uh, when's your Muhammad video coming out? I assume you're referring to the Muhammad, uh, Muhammad's Boom Boom Room series. Uh, we're recording the first uh, set of those. We're recording the first set of those next week, I believe. So I'm here with Anthony for the next couple of days. Then after that, I'm heading to a church in uh, Kentucky. Heading to a church in Kentucky to speak at a uh, conference. Then heading out to meet with vocab malone we're going to be recording that um the first i think four videos of that muhammad series so it's going to be muhammad meets socrates muhammad meets the apostle paul muhammad meets satan and muhammad meets donald trump and so we're going to get those recorded i'll probably release. my goal is to release one of those per week and then as long as people watch them then we'll just record a new batch of four videos each month and just re just release one a month. I mean, one a week for forever, hopefully. Um, <clears throat> hey, look, troll control here is jumping right into the con in, into the content for us. Troll control says, show me where in the Old Testament that God describes himself as three person in one, that Catholic invention. Yeah, well, you want to get into it right now, or um, I don't know. Should don't we know. forestall that question and address it after looking at a few more comments? Right. You want some more comments? Yeah, either way. Um, let's see. You see how fast the comments pop up, right? Yeah. Are you blind? Do you need glasses? I do. I need glasses. You need to put on some spectacles. <laughs> <laughs> um. I hate wearing them, so I just. Uh... <clears throat> uh, let's see. If this was my screen, all this stuff would be larger. Uh, let me see if I can make it larger so you can see it with your old geezer eyes. <laughs> nope. Oh, they do look get bigger. Oh, look at that. Oh, wow. I didn't even know this got bigger. <laughs> Had to do that for Anthony. <laughs> this guy, uh, Harrison, said, Anthony, you look like my dad. I look like his dad. Well, um, I, I, I hope your dad is still alive, Harrison, because I have to say <laughs> your poor, poor dad. <laughs> I thought you were going somewhere else with that. What? You, you're suggesting that his dad might be dead and I look like his dad. <laughs> no. What kind of sicko are you? You see this? You see how you're his mind sicko. thinks? He's always, I, he's always I thought thinking, that's where you were going. What a, what a weirdo. <laughs> um, let's see. We got, uh, we got people watching Pennsylvania. Um, Let's see. To prove, I don't know. Was this was this part two of a two part comment? I see. To prove that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are real. Um, we got people in California. We got England in the house. <laughs> we have a uh, violently subjugate that like button. <laughs> and. Um, that's actually a good way to start. Uh, so NDM <clears throat> says, can you go over the evidence for the resurrection really quick? Um, yes, yes, we can go through the evidence for the resurrection really, really quick. Um, I'll go ahead and give you the really quick version. Anthony can add anything he wants. Um, basically you got two things in order to have, um, in order to have someone rising from the dead, you need to know that he's dead and you need to know that he's alive again later. And we know that Jesus was dead. We know um, we have Jewish sources, uh, Roman sources, and Christian sources all reporting Jesus' death. It was a public event. Um, we know how crucifixion works. We know uh, we know all we know all kinds of the problems that arise when someone is crucified, and we know that you don't survive crucifixion. There is one there is one example ever of a person surviving part of a crucifixion. Right? He survived part of it. Uh, this was after Josephus went over to the Roman side in order to try to end the Jewish war um, quickly. And when Josephus went over to the Roman side, he uh, he asked the, um, the, the Roman general, um, hey, you know, I'm helping you out a lot here. Can you take down my three friends who were just crucified? So they took down the three friends, Josephus's three friends, 
uh, who had just been crucified and two of them died anyway, even with all the medical treatment they could give them, one survived. Um, so this is one person in, in, in all of history, you know, out of all the, who knows, hundreds of thousands of people that the Romans crucified, we are aware of one person surviving part of a crucifixion. He didn't go through the whole process because the, 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 the process wasn't just simply nailing a person to a cross, right? That was part of it. Uh, Roman crucifixion was basically a three-step process. Um, and the first part was the the lashing, right? So you got you got lashed with the, uh, the 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 flagrum or the sometimes called the cat of nine tails, but this is chunks of um, uh, bone or metal woven into strands of leather, and it was designed to rip open human flesh. So it's not a standard whip like we would think of, like a bull whip. Uh, it was meant to when you hit. Um, if it had little, it could have little rocks in there. And those were meant that after they're, you know, beating on you with that for a while, those eventually start to bust open parts of your flesh. Um, or it actually had chunks of metal and bone, which would actually cut into you as they're, as, as they're going and start ripping you open. And the purpose there was that they didn't want you, they didn't want you kicking and fighting as they're trying to nail you to a cross, right? They wanted the, 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 the flogging would weaken you. You've lost a ton of your blood already, and you're basically ready to die after that. And I think about a quarter of the people uh, died just from the beating. So even before crucifixion, even before being nailed to a cross, they would die just from the beating. Uh, and the beating was actually called the half death because you'd be half dead by the time it was finished. So that was just the first step. Then you have what we think of as crucifixion, that's nailing the person to the cross. Um, where basically if you hang, you can try this on some monkey bars if you want, but at the longer you hang in that position with your arms outstretched, uh, the muscles in your chest start to give out and you can't, you can't hold yourself. And basically your chest cavity starts to expand and you can't exhale, right? It takes muscles to, to, to inhale and exhale and your, your chest cavity expands and it becomes hard to exhale. So that's why they would put the nail through your ankles because you needed to push up. You would actually, your, your body would be starving for air and your body would just force you to push yourself up on your feet. So you could, you could catch, you could catch your breath. And so people would go up and down, up and down, up and down. Some people made it like this for days going up and down, uh, on the cross, catching their breath and then, uh, falling back down. Um, so <clears throat> that, that was sort of step two. And then step three was once they knew you were dead, they would, uh, the Romans practiced some sort of death blow. If they weren't going to leave you up there, if they weren't going to leave you up there until you rotted off, they would um, set you on fire or they'd shoot, shoot you with arrows or they would put a spear through you or a sword through you or take you down and let, let wild animals rip you apart. So in, in other words, even after they knew you were dead, uh, they would make sure that you were, you were dead. So we know that Jesus died by crucifixion. Um, it's good. And, and even atheist and agnostic and Jewish scholars consider it one of the best established facts of, of ancient history that Jesus died by crucifixion. So if that were it, Jesus would just be one amongst uh, many other uh, crucifixion victims over, over the centuries of the Roman empire. But shortly after Jesus' death, his followers began claiming that he had appeared to them risen from the dead. Now, there are all sorts of lines of evidence you can go with here. You could talk about the empty tomb and how we know that, that his tomb came up empty and so on. Uh, the, the thing that really um, made me start wondering about the resurrection was that his followers became convinced that he had appeared to them risen from the dead. And uh, here you can, you know, atheists will say, well, so what? People believe all sorts of weird things. Well, Keep in mind, this wasn't just friends. This was uh, friends and foes. Uh, so it was Jesus' original followers. It was the Apostle Paul, who was a persecutor of the early church. It was Jesus' brother James, who thought he was insane during his, uh, during his earthly ministry. Uh, it's a variety of people in a variety of different circumstances on a variety of occasions, all claiming that Jesus had appeared to them, risen from the dead. And um, we know that they weren't making it up because... They, they had to believe what they were saying because oh, most of these guys went to their horrible, bloody deaths claiming that Jesus had appeared to them, risen from the dead. And this is when atheists will say, well, so what? Lots of people die for things that, you know, they sincerely believe doesn't make it true. And there's a difference. There's a difference between someone dying now, a Christian or a Muslim dying today for what he believes and the early apostles dying for, for what they believed because they weren't dying for some message that they heard from someone, from someone else. When a Christian or a Muslim or someone dies today, they're dying for a message that, that was preached to them by someone else. Um, the original apostles of Jesus were dying for something that they saw. And so basically, if they really believe it, and we know they believed it because they're willing to die for it, 
and what they believed they they were dying for was that someone had appeared to them risen from the dead now we have to say what could convince a number of different people um, both friends and foes that they'd all seen a man who had risen from the dead i've never seen i've never seen an explanation that made any sense apart from they actually saw him and so again there are other lines of evidence that you can go with um, I tend to go with Jesus was dead and then he appeared. And so those are my thoughts on it. Do you have anything you want to add? Yeah, I, well, I would just add that uh, once you've established the factuality of the death of Christ as a result of crucifixion <clears throat> and his resurrection, the next question becomes, what is the significance of this? And it's interesting that even though the Jews did not at first recognize the import of certain <laughs> Old Testament passages, right? Predictions about Christ, not only his death, but his resurrection. And when you look back in the Old Testament, you do, in fact, you know, you see evidence of this, right? You see uh, the psalmist constantly uh, crying out to God as though he's in great pain and uh, suffering agony beyond what was normal uh, that ultimately terminates in death. And yet the same psalmist then turns right around and speaks in confident triumph over death. You, you have examples of this in Psalm 16, Psalm 22, Isaiah 53, where uh, the person speaking is, is describing his horrific sufferings, uh, and yet he's a righteous person. He doesn't deserve to die, and it doesn't ultimately end in death, although you know death happens along the way, right? He, he's viewed as ultimately... Uh, being alive afterwards, which we now recognize are, are passages predicting the, the resurrection of Christ. Uh, but so when we look back in these passages in light of the, the event itself, we can see the, the theological significance of what Christ was doing, namely dying for sins and rising again uh, as evidence that he had paid the penalty for sin. That's why death couldn't keep its hold on him, both because of who he was and also because the, the very grounds for the penalty had been removed by virtue of his death. Uh, and then, uh, ultimately, that's, that's something that is of benefit to us, right? He, uh, in Isaiah 53, it talks about uh, the righteous one, my servant, justifying the many, right? By virtue of his death uh, for sinners, uh, it says he will see the light of life, and uh, through his righteousness, many people will be justified. And so... It's not, it's not just, the gospel is not just that Christ died and that he rose, it's that he died for our sins and rose again for our justification. And so historically, we know that Christ died and was later reported alive. Biblically, we know the significance of this. Mm -hmm. All right, so <clears throat> uh, as far as books, what would you recommend? Uh, Lacona and Habermas's uh, Case for the Resurrection of Jesus would be a pretty good, uh, short, easy book to read if you want to uh, go into a little more detail on this. Uh, there are some longer treatments, but um, or just watching some of the debates with William Lane Craig or Mike Lacona or something like that. They give you a basic outline of the evidence for the resurrection. <clears throat> the bill says, uh, David Brian Denlinger, who is against the Trinity, can you do a video on him are you, you know who that is i've never heard of him uh we've never heard of him so probably not hope that helps <laughs> <laughs> uh david here says come on guys we all know that trinity is paul creation all the <laughs> paul books creation. are written by him all the books are written by him wow <laughs> The whole idea of resurrection comes from Paul, who never saw Jesus, but created the whole thing. Atheism rules. I don't know if this is just a troll, like giving like the dumbest comment he could possibly give. But I see so many people who do leave dumb comments like this. I don't know if he's just imitating them. Um, so, 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 so David, please let us know if, if you if you uh, if you want us to take that comment seriously, because is there anything in here that he that he said that is correct? <laughs> well, Trinity I is Paul creation. That's certainly not. All the books are written by him. That's certainly fa false. The whole idea of resurrection comes from Paul. That's false. Who never saw Jesus. That's false. But created the whole thing. Uh, that's false. And atheism rules. That's certainly false. false. So every single thing. Like, I don't know how you pack so many factually false statements into one comment. But uh, if you want us to respond to this and you're, and you're actually sincere, like you actually believe the things that you just posted, uh, let us know. Uh, but... but 
we do find out we do find out occasionally like someone will post a, a ridiculous comment and as soon as we start responding to we finish sometimes we'll spend 20 30 minutes responding to a silly silly comment and then the guy's like oh, i was just joking i wanted to hear you guys just blast that blast that uh <laughs> well that silly but, but there is there is something uh interesting here right muslims uh end up uh exalting paul over allah and muhammad by saying that he had the ability to uh, overturn Allah's original revelation, right? He he mm -hmm. ultimately triumphs over uh, over Allah and Muhammad if, in fact, uh, his gospel is not the same message that Allah was sending through Jesus. But here, this guy ends up saying that Paul is responsible for all the books, and if he really means that, he's not a troll, and he means all the books. That wasn't just uh, you know some him misspeaking. Then we have Paul being responsible for books like Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. That's quite a feat. I think that might even outdo the Islamic uh, <laughs> idea that Paul had overturned the original teaching of Jesus. If he's also responsible for the books of Moses that were written, you know, fourteen hundred years before him, then <laughs> that's that's definitely a feat in Paul's favor. And and Paul really should be uh, celebrated by atheists. I think. Yeah. So. Uh... So, uh, David, let us know if that's true. Did, any, did he respond, everyone? I'm looking, uh, I'm trying to scroll through the comments here. Um, <clears throat> is that something? Well, m those of you on there might have seen him, uh, might have seen other things he's posting. So is that guy serious or is he joking? <laughs> we, don't, we don't want to respond to someone who's just joking. Sometimes we will. Sometimes we will if it's uh, if someone's joking and it's, a, it's, it's something that's so common that we wouldn't mind responding to it. Um, all right. Well, let's just go through it anyway, real quick. Uh, we uh, we know that the Trinity is Paul's creation. Now, the, the Trinity comes from the Bible. Jesus said, go, uh, baptize, go into all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So unless you're saying that Paul wrote the, the Gospel of Matthew, that would be pretty, pretty strange there. Um, all the books are, and as Anthony's going to show, he's showing that the, the Trinity is in the Old Testament. So unless you think the Apostle Paul had a time machine, Went back in time and put all this in the Old Testament. You've got a problem here. All the books are written by him. So notice, not just the letters of Paul. Now it's, um, even if he's just focusing on the New Testament and wasn't even including the Old Testament, that would still be Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and so on. Um, the, the letters of Peter, the letters of John, all of that. All of that by Paul, writing in different styles. This is an amazing dude here. Um, the whole idea of resurrection comes from Paul. That's odd because you have the resurrection in the Old Testament. Uh, we have Jewish writings for centuries talking about resurrection before the Apostle Paul ever comes along. Who never saw Jesus. Uh, doesn't Paul say, have I not seen our Lord? Right? He did see him. He didn't, he didn't see him during his initial earthly ministry, but he saw the resurrected Jesus, but created the whole thing and atheism rules. What exactly is atheism ruling except for some trolling in the comment section? Um, atheism is actually shrinking as a, you know, I know atheists in the West think, oh, you know, I know so many atheists, we're dominating. Actually, atheism is shrinking as a percentage of the world's population because atheists just don't have nearly as many babies as people like Muslims. And so as fast as you guys, you know, convince other people in college that atheism is true, that's nothing compared to the birth rates of people around the world, right? People are out babying you. They're outbreeding you massively. So... Welcome to Fantasyland. If this is a true comment, I mean, if this is if this comment was meant uh, to be taken seriously, then wow, isn't it amazing that the people who regard themselves as the champion of champions of truth and logic can be so deluded in so many different ways? Again, assuming this was meant to be taken seriously. Um, <clears throat> all right. <laughs> hey, check this out. Here's from Alan who says, oh, come on, Anthony, you're a Calvinist. Where's the plug for St. Augustine? Oh, oh, he, I, I see. I'm thinking, what what, what relevance is this? This is re referring back to the question about books on the Trinity, I'm sure. So uh, Augustine wrote a classic work called On the Trinity. So certainly I would recommend Augustine's work on the Trinity. Uh, it's, it's a classic. It's, uh, uh, you know, written by perhaps the greatest, most people would consider him the greatest church father of the ancient church period. Uh, you know, he was a bishop uh, uh, in Africa. Certainly, I'd recommend Augustine, uh, but th there's there's been a lot of work done since the time of Augustine that doesn't fundamentally depart from Augustine, but it, it does delve into things. What, one thing about Augustine is that he didn't know Hebrew, and so in terms of Old Testament evidence for the Trinity, it's not that he didn't have anything to say, 
because he did have the scriptures in you know translated for him into Latin and so forth. Uh, but he 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 was at a disadvantage in as much as he didn't know Hebrew like some other church fathers like Origen and, and so forth. Although Origen is a bit squirrely. Um, someone asked, uh, "How is your boy?" Sorry if you didn't want to talk about it. We've been praying for him. Uh, yeah, um, we had a uh, we have two disabled sons of our five sons. Two are disabled, and. Uh, one of them was deprived of oxygen for several minutes after a nurse turned an alarm down. So, um, yeah, so he was in the hospital for several days and we just got him home yesterday and, uh, he's doing better than he was in the hospital, but we still have to wait. We still have to wait to see how much he's going to recover because it was, it was his muscle, his body and, uh, brain were, uh, deprived of oxygen for, we don't know exactly how long. Um, but his heart had stopped. Uh, he had zero oxygen in his blood. Marie did CPR, uh, got him back out of that. But yeah, you still have to wait a little while to find out how much someone's going to recover from that. Um, where is the evidence for, for the Trinity from Jesus? So here, we that's not kind of the topic. We're about to go into the Old Testament. But um, what do you think that you've done video? You've got videos on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You we, got you we, got you've got a video called the Trinity in the red letters, something like that. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, certainly uh, we could do more on that. More should be done. Uh, that's <clears throat> kind of a response to uh, Yusha Evans, where he's in, somebody's asking him a question and and he makes these these odd comments, you know, about the red letters, as if the Bible has a uh, distinction, right, between the red letters and black letters. And so anyways, uh, that was more of a response to Yusha. It's not very in-depth or anything, but certainly adequate. Uh, but David's already quoted in Matthew 28, 19. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think a lot of people perhaps don't really know the significance, why that text is so weighty. Uh, the reason it's so weighty is because this is the initiatory rite of induction into Christianity. This is the fundamental religious rite that distinguishes a person from the world and marks a person <laughs> off as a, a member of Christ's body, the church, right? And we could talk about other things related to baptism, but the point is this, this was, it, it was like, it was the equivalent of circumcision in the Old Testament. If a person in, under the Old Covenant was a believer in the God of Israel, he got circumcised. If he didn't get circumcised, he wasn't considered a member of the nation of Israel. And so at least in terms of being visibly identified with Christ's people, this, this is the way it's done, right? Christians are baptized. Uh, and so when Jesus uh, says that this is to be done in the name, singular, of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, using the three recurring articles in Greek, uh, he, he's saying that these people are being set apart as belonging to Father, Son, and Spirit. Now, anti-Trinitarians often say the Spirit's not a person, but there's several problems here, right? Why, why would the Spirit, if just an impersonal force, be joined together with Father and Son? But second, notice that it's the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So the Spirit's included in that divine name. And ditto for the person of Christ. Christ is being... Uh, joined with uh, the Father and the Spirit in this uh, fundamental right at the foundation of Christianity. And so, I mean, it's just, it would be blasphemous from the perspective of the Bible that we would be marked off as belonging to creatures. I mean, uh, that's just, it, it, it's ironic because people say that that Christians are, you know, the, the doctrine of the Trinity can't be found in the New Testament because this would be contrary to the Old. Well, what would be contrary to the Old Testament is if Jesus is here saying that you are to be marked out as those who belong to, are the people of, who are to worship and serve the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The other thing is, and we'll look more at the Old Testament, but what's interesting here is the ironic blessing, which is kind of the equivalent of what Jesus is doing in, in Matthew 28. The Aaronic blessing is a threefold blessing in the name of Yahweh, right? It says, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And, and it specifically says in number six, so you are to place my name upon them. So this is how the, the, the priests were marking out the people and blessing them in the name of God. They were pronouncing God's name upon them in a, in a threefold way. And, and, you know, when you trace this out, it's, it's significant and, and, you know, more ties can be made between the, the baptismal formula of Christ and that ironic benediction. 
but you at least see a potential hint there, and we'll, we'll see even greater evidence of the Trinity in the Old Testament. But the, the bottom line is, when, when Christ comes and says, this is uh, the name into which we're to be baptized, uh, it's already from anybody who has any knowledge or background in the scriptures, it's already uh, significant in pointing to the, the nature and character of the God that Christ proclaimed. <clears throat> Medic for Christ uh, goes back to the uh, issue with my son, says, um, hasn't this happened twice now? Um, yes, yes, situation with the nurses turning the alarms down. Because it, I can sympathize with them somewhat because the, the alarm's going off during the day. The, see, alarms will go off that don't have anything to do with, with safety. So um, anytime a child's heart rate falls below 60, the alarm is set to go off. Well, guess what? Anytime you fall asleep, your heart rate goes below 60. So you got this annoying alarm just pinging, hey, hey, he's below 60, which is completely normal when he's when he's uh, sleeping. And then so they just get sick of it. They turn the alarm down, which is fine as long as they're in there and they're they're observing him. Uh, but then they forget to turn it back up. And then later someone doesn't realize an alarm is, uh, is going off. But yes, uh, twice, Paley has died twice. Uh, oxygen, blood oxygen level zero, heart rate zero. And my wife has brought him back twice through CPR and medic for Christ. Maybe you can, um, I've heard this from some paramedics who said that, that, uh, CPR almost never works. Um, I had, I had one who said he did it thousands of times and it worked. I think he said 20 out of thousands that he'd, that he'd done it. Um, so I hear it's rare, but yeah, wife has, uh, has, uh, pulled it off twice. And so Paley's still here. Uh, George here says, David, help me. I'm in Egypt and suffering life here with rough hearted Muslims. Uh, advice, please. Uh, well, George, I, I would basically say two things. Uh, Anthony can add to it. Uh, one, just remember that Christians have been suffering for a long, long time. Uh, persecution. Uh, Jesus said this was going to happen. Jesus said you're going to be persecuted. And Islam is basically the ultimate, ultimate form of uh, the ultimate manifestation of persecution against Christians. Um, it encourages it. And so just know that this isn't something, this isn't something uh, weird or something that, um, that we didn't know was going to happen. Of course, we knew this was going to happen. And probably in this world, it's just going to get worse. So that's one thing. You just keep in mind that this has been part of, part of God's understanding um, all along. And number two, if you can get out of there, get out of there. <laughs> uh, I, I, have a, I know a lot of people who move to the United States or to the UK or to Europe or something like that. Um, so if you can find a, if you can find a way to get out, I would say I would say get out unless you unless you believe you have a good reason <coughs> to stay where you are. Um, if someone's persecuting it, you can go to the next town. That's that is straight out of Scripture. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah. In, in Hebrews eleven, the great chapter on. Uh, the faith of old covenant believers and how they uh, endured and triumphed by faith and so forth. Uh, in particular, in verses 32 through 38, it contrasts those who, you know, accomplished great feats for God and prevailed over their enemies, people like uh, Samson, Jephthah, David, and so forth. Uh, but it contrasts their triumphs with those who appear to have, uh, you know, had the opposite experience, right? People who died, like Isaiah, who was sawed in half. Uh, but the author of Hebrews says this uh, in, in verse 35, uh, others were tortured, not accepting their release, so that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others experienced mockings and scourgings, yes, also chains and imprisonment. Uh, so here, this doesn't contradict David's point, where he says, if you can get out of there, get out of there. Uh, the, the author of Hebrews is saying there are some people who refuse to be released on the condition of denying their faith in God because in their minds, uh, they knew that by suffering for his sake, they were obtaining a better resurrection, meaning their reward, reward in heaven would have been greater as a result of suffering reproach for his name. And so one thing I would say to you is if you can't get out of those circumstances and, and you are stuck there, uh, look forward to the resurrection. I mean, our life is is but a breath eternity's forever and uh you know you're you're you know piling up treasures in heaven and eternity uh what does paul say in, in corinthians that uh uh you know you're you're getting an eternal weight of glory that far exceeds your temporary sufferings mm -hmm. 
Um, <clears throat> more from David <laughs> here. Um, I, I can't help but think that this is a troll. And so I have to take care of this now. Um, so David says, yes, Paul wrote them all. So he's talking about all 27 books of the New Testament. Um, there is nothing about Jesus written before Jesus. <laughs> Anthony, did you know there's nothing written about Jesus before Jesus? Is is There's nothing written about Abraham Lincoln before Abraham Lincoln. You see the problem here, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> um, uh, check this out. Check this out. This is classic. This is classic here. Uh, all the Gospels written by Paul prove me wrong. Yeah, right? Right. And what they mean, that that's like when an atheist says, give me evidence that God exists. God doesn't exist. Prove me wrong. Right. What they mean is <coughs> I'm going to play skeptic right. and let you try to prove me wrong. But I won't accept anything you say as evidence. So uh, anyway, guys, um, <laughs> I, I, I have I do kind of like doing uh, pulling up comments like this because it allows us to make some points about silly trolls and skeptics and things like that. Um, so I will go ahead and respond to this, but, uh, at the same time, we do have issues we want to get to. So we'll do this quickly. All right, David, um, since, since your game here is one, you want to say the stupidest things anyone has ever said, all the, all the books of the new Testament written in completely different styles and completely different locations by completely different people are all nevertheless written by the apostle Paul, which is something that no one who has ever studied any of this has ever said or concluded because they're not massive morons um you're telling us to go ahead and believe believe that and you're saying to prove you wrong and by prove you wrong what you mean is again you'll play skeptic and and you'll just reject any evidence we give you uh in an effort to try to keep us from discussing the topics we're actually here to discuss and from answering actual serious questions by serious people so i'll go ahead and give you this opportunity real quick um I'll play the exact same game. First to me, prove that you exist and that you're not a mindless troll bot uh, that's been programmed to post very stupid comments in order to waste people's time. Prove to me that, prove to me that you're an actual human being um, with actual objections and questions and not a mindless troll bot or a monkey typing stupid things in the chat. So go ahead and prove it. Prove that to us and I'll play skeptic and you go ahead and try to prove it. Oh, wait. I'll give you 30 seconds to prove to us that you exist. So prove me wrong. I'm saying you don't actually exist. You're some sort of uh, artificial intelligence or artificial lack of intelligence uh, that's that's been programmed to post these kind of stupid comments in order to divert actual discussions. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. Where is this guy, everyone? I'm giving him the opportunity. Can he or because, you know, if you can't, then I'm blocking you just so you know, because I can only conclude that you're not an actual human being. And I don't want to sit here responding to a program. <clears throat> I'm being generous. I'm giving extra time here. Another uh, 15 seconds. And then you got to get blocked, dude. Oh, here we go. So he, he responded. All the books were written by Paul. Oh, hang on. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you notice I, I gave a challenge for him for him to prove that he's not a mindless bot. <clears throat> and his response was, all the books were written by Paul. He had to change the way they were written because they would be only one book. Use your brain. So he's claiming that <laughs> Paul wrote all of these books. Notice, uh, notice, like the Gospel of John, that's written after Paul's death. Multiple books were written after Paul had already been executed. So I guess Paul staged his own death um, or had a time machine, one or the other. Um, but notice, ladies and gentlemen, I gave him a simple test to prove that he's not just a mindless bot who's just spouting out this stuff as part of a program in order to distract the conversation. Um, he responded exactly the way we would expect some sort of mindless program to respond. He couldn't actually answer the question and instead just kept repeating the same things. That's what robots do, ladies and gentlemen. That's what robots do. That's what mindless computer programs do. So sorry, Budrow, you got to go. And then we can get back to actually dealing with serious uh, questions and objections. All right, but we should. All right, hide user on this channel. <clears throat> and I can't even feel bad for David here because, again, he couldn't prove his own existence. If you can't prove your own existence, don't ask me to prove anything to you. All right, so, Anthony, why don't we go ahead and jump into this topic. The Trinity in the Old Testament. All right, how long, how long are we going to gonna do this, this we'll will determine uh well gosh we'll we probably go live again tomorrow night 
as yeah. a continuation. And we've got food waiting. And we've got a video series coming out. <laughs> so why don't you give people a little idea, and then we'll probably go live again tomorrow night. So maybe maybe 20, 30 minutes worth, something like that. Okay. Or, or, or shorter, basically whatever you want. And then we'll just we'll spend some time answering some more questions. And uh, so you can answer, we'll, then we'll answer some more questions, and we'll go and wrap up. Okay, so, he, so here's what I'm going to do. I want to throw out a bunch of Old Testament verses that, at least on the face of it, suggest that God is a plurality of persons, that he's not a bare unity like you find in Islam or in post-Christian Judaism. Note, I said post-Christian Judaism, the, the Judaism prior to Christ, some of which I'll, I'll demonstrate in the videos, uh, was not the same as what uh, you find later. Uh, and, and it's not what most people are referring to when they speak of Jews. When Jews, you know, they say Jews believe this, they're usually pointing to post-Christian, anti-Messianic, Talmudic, and medieval rabbis. Uh, but I want to throw out a number of passages that, that, at least on the face of it, suggest that there is a plurality in God, and then ask a few questions relevant to how one ought to approach them, and finally, what, what conclusions should be drawn. Uh, in the first place, and, and some of these passages are, are well known to people, but uh, in the first place, you have numerous occasions, and I, I'm just focusing here on Genesis. You have numerous occasions where God speaks in the plural number. Uh, for example, in Genesis 1.26, God said, prefatory to the creation of man, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Now, here you have the plural pronouns. Really, in, in Hebrew, uh, you have uh, the verb, let us make. It's, uh, in, in Hebrew, the, the, the verbs have uh, number and person. And uh, the, the verb, let us make, cohortative, is, is a uh, one, uh, you know, it's a plural. It's one person speaking to another, ordinarily. Somebody might want to try and explain it differently, but uh, you at least have here a, a term in fact, it's used in, with several terms there, right? Not only let us make man, but in our image according to our likeness. You have a, uh, the use of plural terms, and these plural terms are used of uh, apparently, right? Just at least apparently, those who have the ability to create and, like the speaker, ha uh, bear the image in which man is going to be made, right? Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So you have a plurality of persons uh, involved in making and doing so in their image. So if this is a true plural, uh, it suggests a plurality of persons in the Godhead. And this is not an isolated uh, phenomena. Only two chapters later, when man falls into sin, uh, after eating the forbidden fruit, the Lord says, Behold, the man has now become like one of us knowing good and evil. And this leads God to banish them from the garden, lest they also take and eat from the tree of life and live forever in this, uh, in this condition. And so, again, you have the use of a plural term. And here it's not, just, it's not just God saying, behold, the man has become like us, but like one of us. It's part of it. It suggests a plurality, and it's personal. Man has become like one of us. We also have this happening again uh, in uh, reference to the uh, destruction of the Tower of Babel. Remember, the, uh, the destruction of Babel, the tower builders say, uh, come, let us build for ourselves a, a tower reaching to heaven. And this uh, is contrary to God's command to increase, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. They're, they're doing it in direct defiance to God's command. They're, they're trying to uh, you know, hole up in one spot and, and do their own thing. And so God, in response to this, says, uh, come, let us go down and there confound their language. So the, the plural of the tower builders, come, let us build ourselves a tower, is met with the response, come, let us go down and there confound their language. So God comes down in judgment, and, but he speaks in the plural. Uh, this isn't the only, these aren't the only times you find this in the Bible. There are other instances of that. But uh, in Genesis, you find these three occurrences. But it's also not the only time you find uh, plurals in, in Genesis. For example. Wait, one second, one second. Uh-oh. You've got some objections here. Oh, I'm sure. You've got some objections. <laughs> All right. So Bruce 612 says, I actually heard an argument that when God said, let us make, let us make, he was actually speaking to the divine council who are also created 
in God's image. I see an obvious problem with that, but we have a similar objection here. Let us make. Can't that be talking to angels? And so either the divine council, who are also created in God's image, or angels. I see a glaring problem with that interpretation. What would you think? Yeah, well, so there's a, I was going to come at this a different way. My, my thought was to kind of lay out these passages and say there's something going on here. Uh, and, and then get to the point of asking, how would the ancient Israelite have approached these questions? Many people assume the Israelite thought of God as a unitarian being, and so would have approached these passages with that assumption, uh, and so would have naturally been inclined to think of God speaking to angels or something like that. Uh, but I'll, I'll forestall that and, and go this route. Uh, there are several problems, both in terms of the immediate context and the, the context of, of Scripture as a whole. In terms of the immediate context, there's no mention of angels in the context, right? Now, somebody might say, well, where's a mention of other persons? Well, we'll just hold on to that for, for a moment. Uh, but there is no mention of angels in the context. In fact, when you look in the entirety of the book of Genesis, uh, you'll find that angels aren't mentioned often at all. You know, there, there's a handful of references to angels, uh, but you certainly, you know, don't find it a reference to angels very often, and you certain you don't find them being referred to as creators. This is a fun, and this is the main point. This is a fundamental denial of biblical monotheism. If the first chapter of Genesis is teaching us anything, especially in comparison to the creation myths of the ancient Near East, it's that God, not gods or angels, uh, is the creation is the creator of all things. And notice, uh, it, it doesn't get do away with the inherent polytheism of uh, the angelic interpretation to say, well, we're talking about angels, right? Uh, because you're here, it doesn't matter what you call them. A rose by any other name is still a sweet, as Shakespeare said. It, so you don't have to say the word gods to be in, uh, in, implying polytheism. Uh, you know, if you say angels, but then ascribe to them what is only true of God himself, then you're, you're uh, tacitly involved in polytheism nonetheless. So, so scripture very clearly ascribes creation to God, never to creatures, not to angels, certainly not to other gods. So uh, Isaiah 44, 24, just to give a verse for this, God says that uh, I am the creator and maker of all things, stretching out the heavens by myself, and, and so forth. God alone is, is creator according to scripture. And so let us make cannot be referring to angels or some other beings that would that would involve other things in creation. Absolutely not. All right. No. Um, <clears throat> a couple more things, real quick. Uh, Mr. Ashraf <laughs> here. Just so, you just. <laughs> I don't like putting stuff like this out, but it, it is good to know the the spirit of Islam, because imagine getting like hundreds of comments like this every day. Like every time you you open up your computer, uh, you see comments like this. David, go f your disabled children. Um, this is the spirit of Islam, ladies and gentlemen. And imagine, imagine after all this, still trying to help people who follow the most obvious false prophet in history. And we have to anyway, right? Um, <clears throat> oh, look at this, look at this. Grace Atkins, <clears throat> Jesus Christ. And see if you can remember this quotation here, uh, <laughs> Anthony, because I don't recall this, this quotation. I recall two quotations that were similar to this, but being twisted together here. Jesus Christ himself said, why call me good when there's one greater than me? What, what chapter and verse is that, Grace Atkins? <laughs> chapter and verse for that. You know, one of the things that suggests is that the person's not familiar with the context of either remark, right? Yeah. It, it's, it's like these these statements have been heard in various contexts in the per and in fact this is a perfect analogy to muhammad right much of mm -hmm. the quran looks like somebody hearing things mm -hmm. and and not really having a context for them and, and then just kind of you know merging things together that don't belong together and coming out with a, a very different uh, conclusion yeah so uh, quick quick response there grace uh, one jesus you put this in quotation marks don't do that don't put it in quotation marks if, if this isn't what Jesus actually said, right? Because then you're just misrepresenting Jesus. And, you know, maybe you're someone who doesn't care. Uh, but if you're, a, a, you know, a heretical Christian or a Muslim or something like that, you should care what, what Jesus said. Um, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus didn't say that. He did ask a question, why do you call me good? When someone came up to him and said, good teacher. And Jesus said, why do you call me good? There's only one good. That's God. Notice, Jesus didn't say, hey, don't call me good. 
This is the same Jesus who called himself the Good Shepherd. Did Jesus view himself as good? Uh Uh-huh. Did he view himself as really good? Uh Uh-huh. Did he view himself as without sin? Uh Uh-huh. And yet, he says this person, why are you calling me good? There's only one good. That's God, right? In other words, fallen human beings, fallen sinful creatures are not good. Are you recognizing who I am? Right. Notice, again, he asks a question to someone who comes up to him, calls him good teacher. Why are you calling me good? That's what he says. You combine that with another verse in John 14, where Jesus says the Father is greater than I. And even there, if you read the context, if you go there, that, that's the chapter that starts off with Jesus declaring that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Notice three of Allah's 99 names there. Um, Jesus claims that he can answer prayer in that chapter. Jesus claims that he's the one who sends the Holy Spirit, right? In this this uh, this passage, John 14 through 16, that the Father and Son together send the Holy Spirit, who is also divine. Um, you have all of these things in this chapter. Suddenly, people go right there to the Father is greater than I, ignore everything Jesus is saying there, and completely distort the meaning. If you look at what Jesus is actually saying in context, the disciples are all upset because he says he's leaving, Right? When, If you look at the totality of what Jesus said, Jesus claims that he has laid aside his glory to enter into creation, to be dishonored and disgraced so that he can be the sacrifice for sin, so that he can be a ransom for others. And then he tells his followers, I'm going away. I've lowered myself to enter into this creation. I've laid aside the glory that I had with the Father from all eternity, but I'm leaving now. I'm going back. The disciples are all upset. Oh, he's leaving us. He's leaving us. He says... If, when I tell you I'm going away, if you love me, you would rejoice because the Father is greater than I, right? In other words, Father and Son, Father and Son, eternal relationship. The Son lowers himself to enter into creation. He says, oh, by the way, guys, I'm going back. I'm going back to have that exalted status again, and you're all sad. He says, look, if I tell you I'm going away to the Father, you should rejoice. You should rejoice because I'm going back to the way things were. And then Jesus finishes this section, John 17, 5. Now, Father, glorify me together with you, with the glory I had before the foundation of the world. Right? What do people, you can't understand this entire passage. You can't understand John 14 through 17 apart from the deity of Christ. You cannot make sense of that entire passage. And what do people do? They go, oh, right here he says the Father is greater than I. When he's trying to say, guys, I'm going back to that exalted status that I had before. Right now, I'm lowered. I'm lowered in position. I'm lowered in status. The Father's greater than I, but I'm going back there. And from there, I'll be able to answer your prayers. Don't you want me to go back there? Why are you sad? Why are you sad? That's the point of the passage. And what do people do? Completely massacre the text and distort the words of Jesus, combine it with other things, and then claim to respect Jesus. Very strange. Sultan up there said... Uh, I'm out of here. These people don't know Hebrew. <laughs> I, I'm laughing because I mean I've had. Several, don't you know Hebrew? <laughs> yeah, I've had several years of Hebrew. I mean, uh, I mean that's. May, may, I, don't, I don't. Maybe maybe he's talking. Maybe he's talking about uh, people in the comment, people in the chat, or something. Oh like yeah, that. May, maybe, maybe. For the record, uh, Sultan, if you're if you're if you're talking about Anthony here, Anthony knows Hebrew. Um. Yeah, I mean the. I'm not going to bring up Hebrew, of course, unless there's a, a need for that. I mean, mm-hmm. the, the thing about those passages I just mentioned is it's all right there in the English text. There are other plurals in Genesis and elsewhere in Scripture that don't come through into the English translation. And I'm going to point out a couple right now. But uh, when it comes to Genesis 126, 322, 11, 7, I'm not even sure why, if he's referring to me and, and he's referring to the comments I made, I don't know why he'd be complaining about that. There's no English translation I know of that obscures the plurals that are found there, right? But most English translations do face a difficulty in translating certain portions of the Hebrew Bible because uh, the Hebrew language is simply different than than English. And translating things uh, in a, in, into English sometimes in a straightforward way may give a different uh, impression than one would get from reading things in Hebrew. And so that it does become difficult at some points. Uh, but, but in addition to, to move along, in addition to those passages already mentioned, Genesis 126, 322 and eleven seven, another passage, which this comes through in the English as well, uh, is Genesis 1924 in Genesis 1924. It says, 
uh, the, then the Lord rained down fire and brimstone from the Lord out of heaven. Now, without even looking at the context, this uh, passage, uh, on the face of it again, appears to speak of two persons, right? One person doing something from another. It has the preposition from. The Lord rained fire and brimstone from the Lord out of heaven. Now, the, the context, when you, when you look at the context, it only enhances this, right? In the, in the context, God has appeared to Abraham in Genesis 18 with two angels, and they sup with Abraham, and we quickly find out that the reason why God and these two angels have appeared is, number one, to announce the coming birth of Isaac, and two, to, uh, the angels are, are going to go down and inspect Sodom and Gomorrah and see if... Uh, things are as bad as the outcry that has come up to heaven. Now, uh, so so God stays behind when the two angels leave, and he he talks with Abraham, and he's you know he says basically, I'm about to go down to Sodom where the two angels have gone, and uh, and then he he, he talks about uh, he's he's speaking with himself. He says, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? And so God enters into this conversation with Abraham. Abraham intercedes with the Lord, ultimately gets the Lord to say he won't uh, destroy the city if there are even 10 righteous people in it. And then in verse 33 of chapter 18, it says, then the Lord departed for Ab from Abraham. And so the, the point is, up to this point, uh, the Lord was with Abraham, but now at this point, he's, he's leaving Abraham and going down into Sodom, just like he said he would do earlier in the chapter. And so when you get to Genesis 19.24 and it mentions the Lord raining down fire and brimstone from the Lord out of heaven, uh, the distinction is between someone on earth who's called Lord raining down fire from another person who is in heaven and called Lord. And, and this is the reason this is so significant is, is if you uh, just, just think of this in broad terms. Here, here's what's taking place here. You have a divine person coming down from heaven and appearing in a human form, right? One person comes from the other in human form. Both are called Lord, which in Hebrew is the word Yahweh. And one of them who, who's uh, exercising the judgment, he's, he's investigated, if you will, the situation and is calling down judgment upon Sodom and Gomorrah, but he doesn't exercise this prerogative apart from the will of the one in heaven, right? He, it's, it's, uh, he's calling down the fire from the Lord in heaven. Now, what does that sound like? Any Christian who's read the New Testament knows that sounds just like <coughs> what we read about God the Father and the Son in the New Testament, right? Christ comes from the bosom of God the Father. He assumes a human form, not just assumes, but becomes incarnate. This isn't a temporary uh, thing in the New Testament, but it's already, if you will, sh foreshadowed in, in the Old Testament. But, uh, you know, without, without going too far into that, we at least have another example of what looks like a plurality, a divine plurality in the Old Testament, right? Uh, another example, and this, this is one of those examples that I mentioned is not uh, apparent in the English translation, but in Genesis 20, 13, uh, Abraham speaks of the time when God caused me to wander from my father's house. Uh, in, in Hebrew, the verb caused to wander is actually plural, and it means they caused me to wander. And he's referring to God. So, so Abraham attributes the, the reason for leaving Ur of the Chaldees and his, his father and his family. He attributes it to God, whom he refers to as they. They caused me to wander. Another example of that is found in Genesis 35, 7. In Genesis 35, 7, it says, He built an altar there and called the place El Bethel, because there God had revealed himself to him when he fled from his brother. Well, here, again, the verb is uh, where it says he, uh, God had revealed himself to him, to Jacob. The verb, again, is plural, and it means they reveal themselves to him. Again, God is referred to as they, right? Uh, now, I'm going to, in the videos that I'm about to do that I'm going to record with David, I'm going to get into this uh, in more detail. I'm going to show you contextually why these plurals are being used. But, but the question I want people to ask themselves now uh, in this live stream is, 
I mean, a cardinal rule of interpretation is context, right? Context is king. And part of uh, the context means knowing who the original audience was, right? We can't just assume, you know, everybody loves to say, you know, that we need to read these things through Jewish eyes, right? We need to, we need to uh, not impose our Western uh, ideas on the text. Uh, well, when it comes to Genesis, I think most people don't even know who the original audience was. A lot of people will assume, for example, Genesis 1.26, who was the original audience? A lot of people will assume, well, Adam and Eve. You know, of course, it wasn't Adam and Eve, right? Not even the spoken words. Uh, Adam and Eve weren't there when God said, let us make man. God is about to create man. But my question is, who was the original audience of the written words, the, the literary uh, audience? Uh, the original audience was the Exodus generation, right? Moses is the author of the Torah. Moses is the author of the first five books of the Bible. Moses is the one who penned the patriarchal narratives by inspiration. Uh, he may have had uh, other sources available to him, but ultimately Moses by inspiration is recording what happened prior to the Exodus, and he's doing so to explain to the Israelites, who they are, where they came from, why the Lord has come to save them and has taken them to himself as their God, and, and so forth. And so the, the question was would, uh, becomes, who did the Israelites at the time of the Exodus think God was? Did they think of God as a, a Unitarian being, a, a being who w was simply one person, or did their experience of God, the one who redeemed them from Egyptian bondage, involve a, a revelation of a plurality of persons? And one place that addresses that is Isaiah 63. This isn't by any stretch the only, the only place. But uh, it's actually a lengthy text. I'll just read uh, from 7 to 14, uh, but it actually goes on further. But notice what Isaiah 63, 7 through 14. This is, this is Isaiah, the prophet, looking back upon Israel's former glory in light of her now present condition. In, in, in the context of Isaiah, uh, Israel is now suffering under God's heavy hand, his chastisement, because she's rebelled against the Lord. And, and so I, uh, Isaiah is basically looking back and saying, you know, what happened, right? God God redeemed us from Egypt. Everything was great, and here we are. Uh, everything isn't as it used to be. And so he's longing for God to come back and do for Israel what he had done for her in the past. So he, here's what it says in Isaiah 63, 7 through 14. I shall make mention of the loving kindnesses of the Lord, the praises of the Lord, according to all that the Lord has granted us and the great goodness toward the house of Israel which he has granted them according to his compassion and according to the abundance of his loving kindnesses. For he said, surely they are my people, sons who will not deal falsely. So he became their savior. So first of all, you have Isaiah speaking about the Lord, saying he uh, became the savior of Israel and, and adopted them as his children, which in other words means God is being portrayed here as a father, specifically a father to the people of Israel. But notice how Isaiah goes on and, and tells us that this redemption of Israel was accomplished. In all their affliction, he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his mercy, he redeemed them, and he lifted them and carried them all the days of old. So now you have introduced not only uh, the Lord portrayed as father, but of the Lord saving the people of Israel by means of the angel of his presence. Now, that phrase is uh, significant. Uh, it, it's, it's obviously not talking about just any angel, because this angel is called the angel of his presence. It's not an angel of his presence, but the angel of his presence, a specific angel, an angel who uh, can be referred to as God's presence. Now, a lot of people uh, miss the point here because they, they assume a much later idea or meaning for the word angel. In both Hebrew and Greek, the word angel, the denotative meaning of the word, is simply messenger. 
it doesn't refer, the word itself does not refer to a heavenly creature or a heavenly spirit. It means a messenger, and it's used throughout Scripture to refer to human beings, uh, to the heavenly host, and God himself. And so the word itself doesn't tell you what kind of being is in view. Uh, one, one proof of that is uh, if you look uh, at the prophet Malachi, in fact, the name of the prophet Malachi, the word for, for angel in Hebrew is Melach. Malachi means my messenger. Uh, so the, the prophet himself is referred to as a Melach, an angel. And clearly he's not one of the heavenly hosts. He's a human being sent by God. Well, in G uh, Malachi 3, Malachi predicts uh, that God is going to send a messenger. It says, I'll send my messenger before me and he'll clear the way before me. That passage is actually cited in the New Testament several times, and it's applied by the gospel writers to John the Baptist, who prepares the way for Jesus. In fact, when it's rendered into Greek, the Greek word is angelos, which is the word we get angel from. And so the, the word uh, for angel used in Isaiah 63 does not tell you that the being is a creature. It just tells you that some being, in particular, a being who is God's very presence, was instrumental in the salvation of Israel. But, but notice how it goes on in verse 10. Even though God did this, he brought them to his, himself as sons, he redeemed them by uh, the angel of his presence. Verse 10 says, but they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he turned himself to become their enemy. He fought against them. Then his people remembered the days of old of Moses and, and said, where is he who brought them up out of the sea and so forth? Uh, I could go on uh, and, and the rest of the context uh, even further spells this out. But, but notice how Isaiah 63 speaks of Israel being redeemed from Egypt. Israel was redeemed from Egypt by the saving activity of the Lord, the Father, who, who adopted Israel and became their Savior, the angel of his presence, and the Holy Spirit. These three are said to be Israel's Savior and Redeemer. Uh, God saved and redeemed Israel by means of the angel of his presence and his Holy Spirit. And so uh, my point here in bringing this up is, when the ancient Israelite looked at the kind of stuff that I was talking about in the book of Genesis, they were the original audience, remember, mm -hmm. They didn't come to it thinking of God as, uh, you know, a, a unitary person, uh, uh, as a monad. They they thought of God in, in terms of how He revealed Himself in redemption. They thought of God as a multi-personal being, and so they didn't they didn't approach Genesis one twenty six and say, "Let us," you know, "Who's that?" You know, they didn't they didn't wonder when when God says in Gen or when Moses says in Genesis nineteen twenty four, "The Lord reigned from the Lord." They didn't say. More than one person who's the Lord? What could that possibly mean? Uh, they, they, they weren't approaching this with a blank. They had, they had a context and an understanding that, that they approached these texts with. Now, uh, somebody might ask, well, where does the Bible clearly say that the angel is God or that the Spirit is God? You know, I've shown a passage in Isaiah 63 which mentions all three persons, and says they were involved in the redemption from Egypt, but uh, where does the Bible clearly say that each person is God? Well, uh, we, we could range up and down the Old Testament and, and find evidence galore, but I'll just give uh, one example in the case of the angel and one example in the case of the spirit, and then leave uh, other passages to uh, uh, other discussions. Uh, but... The one passage, I don't know if you want to interject here before I go on, but... Uh, we do have a uh, bunch of quick uh, mm. questions real quick. Okay. Um, normally I would uh, ignore this, but he keeps posting things like this over and over again. <clears throat> Turkey. Turkey seems to have a brilliant objection here. He keeps saying, David Wood, if you had trust for Christianity, Jesus and Christ, you wouldn't have left Christianity to atheism. I never left Christianity for atheism. First of all, you could you could be raised as a Christian and not know why you're, you believe in it and so on and leave it. That wouldn't tell you a lot about the evidence for Christianity. That would just mean that you didn't know a lot about it. Um, but I never left Christianity for atheism. I grew up as an atheist. 
my entire my my all my teenage years i was an atheist i I didn't believe in christianity i believed in christianity when i was 20 years old and so i left atheism and became a christian why have you posted like posted this like 30 times what 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 point are you trying to make here you know what's you know it's funny here uh what religion has the greatest number of apostates i mean by far i and not just from our analysis, but from what the Islamic sources teach. For those that, that don't know, uh, what I, according to Islam, remember everybody is born upon fitra, which means the right belief. They, they have the, the, the right belief in, in one God, in Allah, uh, and are disposed to monotheism. So everybody is born fundamentally as a Muslim. Everyone, uh, get, that, get that through your heads, ladies and gentlemen, when people start talking about people leaving Leaving Christianity or something. According to Islam, everyone is born a Muslim, and therefore... Yeah, so so according to Muhammad in the Quran, now remember, there's no original sin in Islam, at least according to Muslims, right? There, there's no sense in which man has fallen and naturally rebellious towards what God has made known of himself. So they have this concept of man coming into the world. He's a clean slate. He believes in Allah, thinks he's the only God. Uh, but Muhammad said, so everybody is born upon fitra, but it's his parents who make him a Jew, a Christian, or a polytheist. So uh, that, that means that at some point in the course of uh, this young Muslim's life, every Muslim, every person on the planet, somebody else comes along with a message that appears more powerful and more persuasive to them such that they leave this very condition in which Allah created them. And since the world currently has, what, 7 billion people in it? I don't know the exact figure. Uh, is there anywhere close to that number of Muslims in the world? <laughs> I, I Islam, think... the most apostatized religion in history. <laughs> I got to make a video called it. Yeah, there, there's at least, I, I know Muslims, uh, I, I think the most uh, common figure is 1.2 billion or something like that. Uh, so there are about 6 billion people on the planet that apostatize from Islam. So uh, if uh, we could turn the question here on Turkey, uh, you know, if, if Islam were true, why why have so many people left it? Mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know, uh, the vast majority of people on earth. And we're not even talking about those that once professed Islam and left it. We're, you know, because then we could add more people to the list, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and uh, here's another problem we have here. <clears throat> Non-playable Christian, good name. And I have to think that this is a troll, by the way. God is a spirit. Is that true? Yes. That's Aha. True. Okay. Well, Jesus is a man. Ha ha. You never <laughs> thought of that. Bible never answers that with the incarnation. The Bible never deals with that. And in, in, uh, in Philippians 2 and John 1, this, this non-playable Christian here is stumping us, man. Stumping us. God's a spirit, but Jesus is a man. And here's the proof right here. Luke 24, 39. Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. Now, look, notice the massacring of the context, right? The spirit here, when he says a spirit has not flesh and bones, because they thought he was a ghost, right? Right. And so he said, hey, and they say, oh, it's a ghost. It's a ghost. And he says, whoa, wait, wait, if I were just a ghost, I wouldn't have these, uh, I wouldn't have hands and feet. I wouldn't be able to eat. I wouldn't be able to do these kinds of things. Um, Non-playable Christian puts it together here as to say, but God is a spirit and Jesus is denying that he is a spirit. He's denying that he is God. Wow. So I'm wondering, actually, I saw a comment earlier where somebody made reference to Mormons, and I'm wondering if this person may be commenting or replying to an LDS person. Uh, but th in any case... Starting off with God is spirit, and then Jesus... God is uh -huh. spirit, Jesus is man. Oh, yes, yes, And yes. then uh, okay. a spirit has not flesh and bones. So right. Jesus isn't a spirit, but God is a spirit. So not the same thing. See that? Right, right. So uh, as David already you know, <laughs> sarcastically pointed out... Uh, you know, th this assumes uh, an ignorance of what, what the Gospels are, are making painfully clear, right? That Jesus is the incarnation of the second person of the Trinity. Jesus is God become flesh. And Jesus doesn't cease being God when he becomes flesh. So it's not as if his, his divine nature becomes a human nature, right? He's joining a human nature in his one person so that the person who is the second person of the Trinity now also has a human nature. And so that's why the Gospels, 
uh, can say in one breath that Jesus knows everything and in another breath say, you know, he didn't know something. That's why the Gospels can say that Christ is in a specific spot and then in another place uh, imply that he's everywhere, right? Uh, you have Jesus saying things like, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them, right? So Christ promises that his presence is, is there with his people, which wouldn't be true if he were only a man. The resurrected Christ in Matthew 28 repeats that when he says, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the ages. Uh, in John 21, Peter says of Jesus, Lord, you know all things in response to Jesus' repeated question about uh, whether or not Peter loves him. Uh, so, so scripture makes these statements about Christ uh, that uh, presuppose what they also make explicitly clear elsewhere, right? That Jesus is the incarnate God. Uh, so passages where Jesus affirms that he's really a human don't uh, overturn the Christian belief. Yeah, especially at all. in the context where they're, ah, it's a ghost. <laughs> and that's what he's responding to. Yeah. yeah I, I'm physical. I'm physical because that's yeah. what resurrection means. You, you know, what's, uh, what's some, uh, additionally humorous about this is if you look at uh, a passage like Mark six, remember Jesus comes walking on the water mm -hmm. and the disciples are afraid because they think they're seeing a ghost. And, how, and Jesus responds to them and he says, do not be afraid, it is I. Uh, the literal Greek there is ego and me, which is I am. Don't be afraid, I am. When you look at the Old Testament background for this, it's clear that Jesus is identifying himself by the divine name. In Isaiah 43, in fact, uh, speaking of the future, it, Isaiah is looking forward to a new and better redemption than the one previously accomplished uh, when the Israelites were redeemed from Egypt. Looking forward to that, the, the prophet Isaiah speaks of uh, God being with his people when they're uh, uh, passing through the sea or passing through the fire. And it says that he will say to them, do not be afraid, I am. So you, you look at the context, uh, it's remarkable. But in any case, you have in uh, when the Hebrew of Isaiah 43 is translated into Greek, it's rendered in the exact same way. And so uh, I just find that ironic because they think they see a ghost and Jesus identifies himself as God, uh, which involves two of the... <laughs> so he identifies himself as God and as man. Mm -hmm. Shocker. Yeah. Total shocker. Christianity. I'm glad we do these live streams yeah. so we can find out these uh, startling facts we never knew. Yeah. Uh, Arland here, uh, he just had a quick question. He says, he, uh, I tried to do a one-time patron... Um, could not find a button. Is it me? No, I don't think, I think Patreon just allows you to sign up for, for monthly. So the, 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 the way to make, if you wanted to make a, a one-time contribution to someone, um, you would just sign up for it and then take it down afterwards. You know what I mean? So you just take it down after, after the one-time donation. So, uh, anyway, that's how you do it. Um, all right, let's see. Uh, hmm, all right. Uh, I want to go, want to wrap it up around nine thirty. Yeah. So you got some more yeah. stuff or you want to take questions? Well, yeah, let's mm -hmm. see if we have questions. My, my thought was, uh, I mean, because there's obviously more passages we could look at, but I, I was I was just trying to get people to start thinking along the lines of uh, how would a person, because what people do is they like to just create answers for uh, something like Genesis 126, right? They like to say, uh, you know, it's God speaking to the angels, you know, but but the, the relevant uh, thing that a person should be focusing on is how would an Israelite have approached these passages? How would an Israelite thought of God? Uh, what would have made? What would have been intelligible to him in terms of you know when it says something like "Let us make man in our image"? The angels aren't even a viable candidate to the ancient Israelite, right? They love people love to talk about how the Trinity doesn't come along till later. It's anachronistic. We're reading back into the Old Testament. Uh, but where, pray tell, do you find any grounds for thinking the Israelite would have thought of plugging in angels into a, a, in a, a thoroughly monotheistic text and ascribing to them a work that could only be performed by, by God? Oh, I, I did say that I would give two passages relevant to establishing the deity of the angel and of the spirit, right? Mm -hmm. So one second. So you're going to give those passages, right? Yeah. All right. I just want to pull this up real quick, just so people can know where I'm going after this. Stephanos says, why comment on the idiotic trolls and yet no comments on intelligent objections 
<laughs> to the Trinity. I assume that he means his intelligent objections to the Trinity. I haven't seen any yet. Um, I pull the comments up as I, as I see them. But right now I'm going to scroll back through Stephanus's comments and pull up Stephanus's comments because he apparently um, views them as the intelligent comments that we're ignoring. So I'm going to go that. So while Anthony is giving these, I'm going to look back through Stephanus's comments so we can see his brilliant comments. Go ahead. Okay, so uh, one of many texts that speak about the angel of the Lord and uh, directly to the issue of his uh, deity is found in uh, Genesis, or excuse me, Exodus chapter 3. Most people are aware of the call of Moses to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt. They, they, they know the, the, uh, the, the basic uh, idea of the narrative. God appears to Moses in a burning bush. He speaks to Moses, tells Moses that he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, says that he's going to lead Israel out of Egypt and do so in fulfillment of the promises he made to their fathers. And then Moses... Uh, astutely, right, he realizes, you know, I'm going to go to this nation of people that are in bondage to the Egyptians. And what's the natural question they're going to ask me? They're, they're probably going to have a whole string of questions, right? Uh, but one question they're going to ask is, who is this God, right? What is his name? Right? What do we refer to this God as? And and so Moses, Moses tells the Lord, you know, I'm going to go to this people, they're going to ask this, and what shall I tell them? And everybody knows the answer. The, the Lord replies to Moses, I am that I am, Thus shall you say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. This, this response in Hebrew is uh, related to the name Yahweh. That's why in verse 15 it actually goes on to say, uh, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. So this is how God identifies himself to Moses at the burning bush. God appears in the bush, he speaks to Moses from the bush, and he calls himself Yahweh. The Jews recognized that this was a unique name, a distinctive name, a name that could only be used for the true God. And the significance of that is, is manifold, but uh, one thing is, uh, in Scripture, the term God is sometimes used to refer to, to beings other than the true God, right? Uh, it doesn't mean that they're really God or they're God in the absolute sense, or that we can't tell the difference when we read, you know, a statement about God, if it's talking about the true God or not. Uh, but there, there, it, there is at least the fact that the word can be used in a variety of ways. And so the one thing that's not true about the name Yahweh is that it can be used of anyone other than the true God, right? It's referred to as God's memorial name in, in verse 15. Jews refer to it as the Shem Ha Mafaresh, the distinctive name. And, and recognize that Scripture attributes this to the true God alone and not to any creatures. Now, the reason I'm belaboring all of this is uh, because what most people miss is that we're given a further identification of who it was that talked to Moses. If you go back to the beginning of the context, starting in verse 1, it says, Now Moses was pasturing the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Horeb is another name for Sinai. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. And when uh, the Lord saw that Moses turned aside to look, and, and then the context goes on. The, the point is that the, the one who appeared... The one who spoke, the one whom Moses is questioning, is specifically identified in verse 2 as the angel of the Lord. It's the angel of the Lord who identifies himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in verse 6. It's the angel of the Lord who identifies himself as the I am that I am in verse 14. The angel of the Lord who identifies himself as Yahweh in verse 15. And remember... Uh, the word angel, as, as I already mentioned in Hebrew, th th there's simply no uh, Greek, or excuse me, no Hebrew lexicon from uh, Gesenius, who is the father of all Hebrew lexicons, to Brown Driver and Briggs. There's no lexicon on the planet that would say the Hebrew word melach for angel literally means a created heavenly host. It can be used for them, but it doesn't tell you 
Uh, it's just it just means messenger. And like I said, it's used for human beings. It's used for the heavenly hosts, and it's used for God Himself. And so you have to look at the context to know who's being referred to. Well, in Exodus chapter three, quite clearly. The Melach, the one who's appeared to Moses and is speaking with him, and for that reason called a Melach, a messenger, uh, this one identifies himself as God. In fact, what does he tell Moses? He tells Moses, take the shoes off your feet. The, the ground on which you're standing is holy ground. And so uh, when Isaiah 63 mentions Israel being saved by the Lord, the angel of his presence, uh, and the Holy Spirit, we now have clear evidence that, uh, that the angel was involved in the redemption and that the angel is a divine person. Moreover, he's a distinct person, right? Since he's distinguished from uh, another person identified as Lord, we have evidence for plurality uh, within the Godhead. So I uh, can stop there and see if we have Yeah, you'll have before. to because uh, as you can see, some people need attention. Yeah, yeah. Right? Oh, this guy we needs can say, attention. Yeah, we can say, hey, we're going to talk about a topic, and some people, uh, well, <laughs> well, why aren't you paying attention to me? No comment, inconvenient truth. There's like a million of those, right? Why, why, why are you ignoring me? Why are you ignoring me? Uh, maybe we, maybe we, we're, we're here to talk about a topic. Anyway, all right, let's go. So let's start. Um, Marcion was right. Jesus of Pauline philosophy is not compatible with the God of the Old Testament. Uh, are you aware of anything in Pauline philosophy that's inconsistent with the God of the Old Testament? You know, it's you know, it's funny is uh, Martian also edited Paul's writings, right? I mean, so, so if <laughs> Martian was right, if you cut up the Bible, yeah, uh, snip, uh, snip, snip. But, but the funny thing is, so he he cuts up Paul, and uh, according to Martian, the verses he's cutting out of Paul were not truly Pauline, and so he, in his mind, uh, well, I mean, I don't know this guy. I don't think he really understands. Um, but but he had to cut out he had mm -hmm. to cut out of Paul's writings uh, uh, things that were clearly positive with respect to God according to the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul most certainly was not a Marcionite. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Paul, let, let's not forget Paul. Paul's a Pharisee, right? Uh -huh. Paul was a Pharisee. Um, you don't get more dedicated to the Old Testament Scripture, the Old Testament God, than being a Pharisee, and when he was out persecuting the church, it's because he held strictly to that God, right? And then when he became a Christian, it wasn't, oops, I was wrong about that God. It was, I didn't understand some of the, some of the scriptures and some of the prophecies and so on. In other words, um, he understood that the rabbis had misunderstood some of these texts and they were passing on their own traditions rather than a correct understanding. So Paul doesn't reject the Old Testament. He affirms it all along. So um, I think Stephanus here just, I don't know, maybe he likes to see. Notice, to the, that would sound intelligent, right? Marcion was right. Jesus of Pauline philosophy is, is not compatible with the God of the Old Testament. Absolute nonsense to anyone who knows anything about Paul. All right, so that's one. Let's go up to, oh, go ahead. And, I mean, just to throw in as well, it, it's not just... Paul, who tells us that Paul was not a Marcionite, right? We also have other New Testament writers who refer to Paul. Mm -hmm. We have the writings of Luke, and in Luke's writings, we know that. So, I mean, because somebody could say, you know, uh, uh, that that Marcion was was right. You know, Marcion's a, a later writer, and you know, when we look at other writings of the New Testament, it's it's clear that uh, Paul wasn't a Marcionite. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, now check this one out. You notice I, I notice a common problem with people miss completely misrepresenting what someone has said. Check this out. <laughs> Jesus said in the Gospel of Matthew, "I have not come to abolish the law, but to affirm it." Come on, David, kill your rebellious son. Is that what Jesus said? But to affirm it? No, he said to to fulfill to it. To fulfill it. <laughs> right. To aff notice to affirm is just like I affirm all of this. Which, which Jesus Jesus would as, as the law that God gave to the children of Israel. Um, but that's not what he says there in Matthew. Notice, notice the difference, but to fulfill it. This is fulfill in, the, in, the, in a sense that's parallel to fulfilling prophecy, right? He's fulfilling, he's the fulfillment of these things. He's the, he's, he has fulfilled these things. He came to fulfill these things, right? Is that, the, is that notice we have a, a misquotation here. Um, so Jesus has not come to abolish the law, but to 
affirm it, and come on, David, kill your rebellious son. <laughs> yeah, David, uh, when did you stop beating your wife? <laughs> it's, it's just, uh, not only is he, he misrepresenting the Bible, he's mm -hmm. pretending that uh, your son is a rebellious son, so you should be implementing the Bible on your own son. Yeah. Uh, maybe he's not trying to go that far, but that's mm -hmm. how he's worded it, certainly. But, um, well, uh, yeah, he is right down here. Oh, is he? Come on, David. Jesus His told you to kill, kill your disobedient son. Yeah, get get busy. I just now, saw David, which I don't know which son you're referring to, but I just saw them. They're all quite obedient. Now, 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 now notice. Uh, so Jesus told me to kill. Uh, Anthony, are you are you familiar with where Jesus told me to kill my disobedient son? Well, I, I assume that he's claiming it in Matthew 15. Uh, no, no, no. He's actually, well, Jesus is oh. God. So that was Jesus. Oh, is that what he's saying? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, there. Uh, I mean, there in 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 Matthew, Jesus is talking about talking to people about respecting their their. He's talking to the yeah. religious leaders about respecting their parents, uh -huh. right? About being bad children. Um, so he's talking to children, not not little kids, but the children of. Yeah. These are already religious elders, so these are grown people. He's talking about how they are treating their their parents there. So he's not talking about parents about hurting your kids or killing your kids. He's talking about he's talking to people, grown adults, about how they're treating their uh, their parents and so on. Um, so what he's talking about is, yes, Jesus is God. So in the Old Testament, so in the Old Testament, mm -hmm. where you kill disobedient, and keep in mind, guys, guys this is not this is not like five and six year olds here. When it's right. talking about your sons and so on, this is your, your uh, son who is fully aware of what he's doing. And it's not just... Um, the disobedience here, it's not like he talked back to you or something like this. This is like you're calling down curses on your father and your parents and so on. And under the Old Testament law, uh, if you just became the, like the most horrible, the horrible, most horrible son imaginable or something like this, um, that was a death penalty under the that covenant, right? Notice, first of all, first, before we even look at that, that's not the, that's not the covenant we're under. Are, are you do you think that we're under that covenant? No, there are all sorts of differences between uh, <clears throat> the New Testament requirements for Christians. Yeah, Certainly, so, the, so, so, I think there's ethical continuity mm -hmm. between the Testaments, but here we're talking about uh, mm -hmm. issues of penology and so forth. And yeah, so it, so uh, so here with this situation, Jesus told you to kill your disobedience. Are you aware of anywhere Jesus told me? Because notice you had these commands directed towards the children of Israel. And we'll talk about that context in a moment. Directed towards the children of Israel. Does that have anything to do with me, right? That's not a command towards me. That was, hey, you guys are under this covenant with God. You're under a certain covenant. Covenant is, a, is an agreement between God and people. God says, you do this, and I'm going to do this. So that's the agreement. And the children of Israel said, yes, we agree to that covenant. Um, the covenant I'm under is the covenant with, with Jesus Christ through his blood. In order for Jesus to have commanded me to kill a son, then I would have to be—that would have to be part of my covenant. Are you aware of that being part of part of the covenant that we're under? No, I, I also think though that he's misrepresenting the law a good bit uh -huh, because uh -huh. even under the law, you wouldn't be responsible for executing your own child if he violated uh, the you know those things that that are grounds for uh, what's it, you know this penalty. Uh, what the law says is that, you know, basically an incorrigible child is to be executed. It doesn't mean the parent executes the child, but the parent does have to basically be involved in the act. He has to, you know, in other words, it says that if, if your child, if the, if the person grows up and he's incorrigible, even the parents can't rein him in. He's old enough to curse his, you know, mother and beat up his father. And he's a drunkard because that's what's being said about mm -hmm. this child in the context of those passages, uh, that person is to be brought to the leaders, the elders in the city gates, and it's they, the the elders who are supposed to to execute that person. But but the law does say that the parent is not to, uh, uh, you, you know, uh, is not to be more concerned for the welfare of their child than the the righteous law of god and you know but uh mm -hmm. but the point is that i'm making is not even under the law would you be required to do that you mm -hmm. just you'd recognize the justice of god's law and say yeah my child is is a rebellious blasphemous and, and again uh, again this is not your your, your seven-year-old right yeah this is you've grown up and you are really 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 bad again we will we will talk about why that would be the case because now we don't we don't believe that's the situation right now we don't say oh hey you know my son he's 25 years old He's uh he's addicted to drugs and stuff like that. 
I'm going to take him and 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 have him executed. So why don't why wouldn't we believe that? We'll we'll get to that in uh, one one second. Um, so notice um, he's making it sound like, hey, my six year old just spoke back to me. I need to go kill him mm -hmm. according to Jesus. And notice it's Jesus here, right? Jesus is post incarnation, right? You have you have the divine son, you have the word and so on. As far as Jesus, the the human being Jesus, the incarnate son Jesus, you're talking about way before that. You're talking about way before that here. So be careful in how you're talking about this, right? Jesus told you to kill your disobedient son. Um, there you would have to quote Jesus. Um, so let's get rid of the uh, inco inconvenient truths and no comment, David. Um, <clears throat> so we looked at this. Jesus said in the Gospel of Matthew, I have not come to abolish the law, but to affirm it. No, he didn't say. But um, and we have the, the kill your rebellious son here. Uh, guys, think about the situation, right? So the Jews are slaves. The Jews are slaves in Egypt. God brings them out of Egypt. Then he brings them into the promised land. And he says, here's the agreement. Here's what I'm going to do. And here's what you're going to do. Um, if you look at the things God promises as part of the covenant, if they fulfill their side of the covenant, it's, hey, there's going to be no disease. There's not going to be miscarriages. You're going to have everything you need. I'm going to take care of all of your needs. Look, God is here. The, 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 the God who's, who's giving them these orders is there as a pillar of cloud. Uh, by day and a pillar of fire by night. So think of think about the implications here because we look back and say, oh, if people rebelled, oh, there was this harsh penalty. Guys, if there is a pillar of cloud there and that pillar of cloud guided you out of slavery and crushed all of your enemies and that, that uh, pillar of cloud then says, guys, uh, don't do this. Don't grow up and be a, a, a horrible drunkard who calls down curses on your own family and beats up your dad and your mom. And you say, no, screw that. I'm going to do it anyway. Notice that's a different situation than your than your, your your son or your daughter growing up to be bad nowadays, right? That sort of direct rebellion in the face of overwhelming proof of divinity, right? From the God who gave you everything and promises to bless you in all these ways. It's a different kind of situation, right? It's yeah, it's 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 harsh penalties, but extreme blessings, right? That's the covenant they entered into. The Jews entered into that covenant. The Jews said, yes, everything you're listing right now, we agree with it. If you ever decided, hey, I do not want to be part of this covenant, the border was like five miles that way. The border is five miles over there. Leave that leave this covenant land, go five miles that way. You're free to do whatever you want over there, right? And so the people who stay there, no, we want to be part of this covenant. We are under this covenant. We have agreed to this covenant. That pillar of cloud over there is telling us these rules. If you stand there on that land and say, I don't care what that pillar of fire says. I don't care what that pillar of cloud says. I'm going to do all this stuff that we've agreed not to do. Guys, I don't, I don't, I don't, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, God has the right to wipe all of us out, right? God has every right to just wipe all of us out when we rebel against him. If you're rebelling to that extent, in the presence of the God who redeemed you in that sort of situation in that land under that covenant, guys, it can be pretty with all of that said, um, there are some qualifications that you might want to, uh, look at. There was apparently some sort of ransom system for all kinds of situations. Um, that's based on when, when it talks about capital murder, it says, but for this, you shall accept no rant. You shall accept no ransom for this. So some commentators have said that there was a ransom situation, uh, a, a, a ransom system for other offenses. You've seen that before. Yeah, and, and then you do have uh, in Israel's history when you see crimes committed, uh, actual crimes, uh, the, the penalty sometimes involves banishment, right, exile. Mm -hmm. uh, so th there are other you know, ways uh, that these things could be dealt with. The law, I, I would say, in some cases is giving a, a, a maximum penalty, right? And, and it basically, in some sense, like our laws, right, certain things would have to be taken into account. There are mitigating circumstances mm -hmm. for certain things. And so you do find that kind of uh, uh, leeway. But by the way, I couldn't help but uh, uh, think, as you were mentioning, uh, this, this was this guy was clearly going off topic. Can't can't keep his eyes focused. Uh, but it, you mentioned the uh, the pillar of fire by uh, day and the or the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by mm -hmm. night uh, and God being present in their midst and 
And so when people are rebelling, they're doing so in the immediate presence of God. Uh, but this is relevant to our discussion, actually, because the one who was in the fire, according to Exodus 14, 19, was the angel of the Lord. Mm -hmm. and, and so notice the consistency here, though. Most people miss this. There's actually this buildup that's taking place in the book of Exodus. In Exodus chapter 3, how does God appear? He appears in a blazing fire in the midst of a bush. And we're specifically told it's the angel of the Lord. Then when Israel is being led out of Egypt, God comes in a pillar of fire and cloud, right? He throws the Egyptians into confusion on one side and he's, uh, you know, protecting Israel on the other side. And then as they're going through the wilderness, he, he moves ahead of them or behind them as uh, the needs are. Uh, but now, now God is not simply appearing in the midst of a fire in a bush. He's now appearing in the midst of Israel and in, in a much grander way, right? Mm -hmm. Well, then later when Israel gets to Sinai, we're told that the mountain was ablaze, right? And the Israelites are fearful. God is speaking to them from the mountain. Well, uh, I'll, I'll show in, in one of the videos that I do that the one who was speaking to Moses from the mountain was the angel of the Lord. And he's explicitly identified as God again, as Lord. So he's not a created angel. Somebody earlier, I didn't get to see the whole comment, but the person said, stop blaspheming. Jesus is God, not an angel of the Lord. I made it very clear that yeah. the word angel does not mean a creature. It does not mean a heavenly uh, created being. It could be used in reference to them, uh, but it, it doesn't, by the word itself does not mean that. It mm -hmm. just means uh, someone who's present, someone who's engaged perhaps in the activity of saying something. That's all it takes to be a melach, an angel, according to the Bible. 50% of the time when the word is used in the Old Testament, it's used for men. I mean, it's so it, it doesn't even, in most of its occurrences, refer to the created heavenly host. Only, and I'll challenge anybody on this, only 17% of the time it's used in the Old Testament does it refer to the heavenly host. 17%. That's negligible compared to its predominant usage. So for somebody to say, I'm blaspheming because I said Christ is an angel, shows they don't know the first thing about at least the meaning of that word in Hebrew or in or in Greek. The word is used throughout the New Testament to refer to human beings. It's used to refer to John the Baptist. It's used for Jesus. Jesus is explicitly called an, an angelos in, uh, in uh, Matthew 1, John 1, uh, Luke 3. So, I mean... Uh, you know, the, the person who says I'm blaspheming doesn't know what they're talking about. It doesn't know what I'm talking about. They didn't listen to me. Jesus is not a creature. The use of the term angel for him does not point to him as a creature. The title, the angel of the Lord, refers to not a, a human being or a created heavenly uh, spirit, but to a theophany of God himself. God himself appearing uh, in a visible way to his creatures. And the proof of that is right there in the text. I gave it to you from Exodus chapter 3. That's one of, you know, 50 plus texts that talk about the angel of the Lord and identify him as God. All right, so final kind of issue here. You're you're missing the killing of Canaanite children. Um, yeah, and missed uh, that. By the way, I had an entire debate uh, on this topic with Shabir Ali. Uh, you can type into the YouTube search... Um, is the Bible a book of peace? We did two. We did is the Quran a book of peace and is the Bible a book of peace where we went into more detail on this. <coughs> um, let me give you two, two basic views right now. Um, so and the, the sort of traditional view that um, uh, God commands um, the, the Israelites to go and just completely wipe out the Canaanites, right? So God commands the Israelites to go and wipe out the Canaanites, right? And so the question would be, why wipe out all of them? Um, and the idea there is God gave them four centuries to stop what they're doing after warning them, and they keep getting worse every generation. Does God know if they're going to keep down this path? Uh, of course he does. So does God have the right to say, all right, this, uh, I keep giving, and keep, keep in mind when we're talking about being really, it's things like um, sacrificing their own children to, uh, as a, as worship to God, bestiality, sex with animals, things like that. That's that was the that was the heart of this culture. Um, so God says, wipe them out, right? So the question is, is God allowed to do that? Does God know uh, the future of what these people are going to do? Uh, I would say yes. 
does God have the authority to uh, to execute judgment like this? Uh, of course he does. Again, my, my view is God could wipe us all. In fact, I'm, I'm saying this, when I was an atheist, lots of people uh, use what's, lots of atheists use what's called the argument from evil. If God exists, why is there so much suffering in the world? I had kind of the reverse. Um, it was, if God existed, he would wipe us out for the things we do, but he hasn't wiped us out. So there is no God. That was my, that was my reasoning, right? Uh, I didn't have much, much concept of a patient God who would put up with the things that we do. Um, so anyway, does God have the authority to say, hey, I know this, every generation is getting worse and I know that they're only going to continue getting worse. I'm putting a stop to it so that this culture does not pollute the rest of the world. Um, I would say God has the authority to do that. And so if God wants to do that, God, God, God can do that. Uh, so that is, that's sort of the traditional understanding. Um, other people have pointed out some different possible interpretations that arise from some issues in the text. Um, and this would be relevant, Stephanos, uh, and I talk about this in my debate with Shabir Ali. But um, if anyone wants to go through the text, this would be a, a good little exercise. Go through the text that are leading up to, so through the Exodus and going up to um, <clears throat> the children of Israel, getting to the promised land, the commands. God offers two kinds of commands that sound like completely different things. Uh, on the one hand, he says, go wipe them all out. Don't leave, don't leave alive anything that breathes. On the other hand, he keeps saying, drive them out before you. And God says that he will drive them out before you. And God says that he will drive them out little by little so that, you know, they don't become too, too proud and so on. Now think about that. Those sound like two completely different things. One, wipe them all out so that there's nothing left. Two, drive them out of the land. Those sound like the same thing. If I say, hey, there's a group of people over there, go wipe them out. That sounds like one thing. If I say, hey, go drive them away. That sounds like completely different things, right? Well, interestingly, you can count them up. You can do the math. The commands to drive them off the land, to drive them out of the land, um, about 80% of the commands are like that, right? And about 20% of the, com the commands talk about just completely wiping out everything. And so a question arises because of this. Uh, why, does it, why is it using two completely different sounding commands here? One sounds like you're wiping them out. Two sounds like you're driving them off the land. And so the question would be how you, how you reconcile these. One way of reconciling them would say, well, God means, you know, just drive them all out, drive out whoever you can, but whoever refuses to leave, then wipe them out. Something like that. That would, that would be a kind of way of, of trying to reconcile these. Um, there's another way though. Now, so that's one of the issues that arises. Another issue that arises is all of the groups that are supposedly wiped out are around later. We're talking all the way up through, all the way up through, through Samuel and so on. Um, the groups that are all said to be completely wiped out until there's no, there's no one left, they all show up later, right? So the Midianites are supposedly wiped out until only the women were left. Only the women who hadn't slept with someone in, in this conspiracy to, to lead the children of Israel astray. They're completely wiped out. There's none left. Then the Midianites show up later in, later in the book of Judges, to and are in such tremendous numbers that the Jews had to go and hide in the cracks of rocks to to escape this massive multitude of Midianites who were invading. How is that possible if they've been completely wiped out? Right. So that's one. You have the Amalekites being wiped out in Samuel to where um, uh, Saul gets them down to the last guy, the last Amalekite, the king, the king, King Agag. He gets them down to the last guy, and then. Uh, Samuel comes along and says, no, we, 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 we're, we're executing this guy too. So there's no more Amalekites. Later in the same book, David has to stop and, and, and Am has to stop the Amalekites. What, what, what do you, what do you, what, what's going on here, right? All of the groups that are said to be completely wiped out and genocided are all around in massive numbers later on. And again, you have these commands that sound like completely wiping them out, but they're used interchangeably with commands to drive them off the land. So they're and by the way, this goes all the way into the New Testament, right? Even in the New Testament, you have, you, when in, des in describing those wars, we'll talk about commands to, tr to drive them out and as uh, completely wipe them out. So what, how do we reconcile these? Um, I don't know. And you can, you can do some things with them. You can say, yeah, well, they wiped them out, but there were still some left over and they multiplied or something like that. Um, people like Paul Copan and, and others have argued that the uh, the talk of completely wiping them out um, is called hagiographic hyperbole, and they base this on texts that are uh, texts from other surrounding groups during that time. 
what you find is when groups would win a war, so you send your you send your military out, the Egyptians go out to fight a group and the Egyptians win the battle. The Egyptians in their writings would describe it as complete extermination of that nation, even though all they did was win a battle against uh, against the army. Right. Uh, there are even people who did this against Jews. You can find ancient writings that say, hey, we went out to the, we went out to the Israel and we completely wiped them out so that there was not a breath of any Jew left alive. No, what are you talking about? Of course, there were Jews still alive. Right. Um, so it was kind of the, the, the parallel. And again, I'm not saying this is right. I'm saying this is this is a this is a this is one in one way of reconciling the text. Um, uh, the, 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 the parallel here, we do something similar, not anywhere near the same extent, but we do something similar when you say, hey, my sports team uh, slaughtered your sports team, right? Um, we annihilated that other team. You don't really mean annihilated. You don't mean that at all. Um, when you say my team slaughtered them, uh, you don't really mean that. You don't mean slaughtered. You don't mean literally slaughtered, right? But imagine, uh, imagine you wrote this down and or people recorded you saying, we slaughtered them, we slaughtered them. And imagine a thousand years from now, people get that video clip of you saying they, they, they slaughtered them and they don't use language like that anymore. They have no they have no concept of using language like that. They don't they only use the word slaughter literally. They only use annihilated literally. Right. Suppose that suppose that were the case. And you'd look and say, whoa, this guy said the Pittsburgh Steelers slaughtered the Baltimore Ravens. That's so horrible. Why would you slaughter a team over something like a football game? It's so, it's so horrible to slaughter these people. Right. And there you would say, no, 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 that's not, that's not how we're using. That's not how we're using this, right? Language, language has changed. We have a certain kind of, uh, we have a certain way of using language. We have certain literary devices here, right? So anyway, the claim, again, not saying it's true, but here's what you have. You have the surrounding nations of the Jews. They all use a literary device that is called hagiographic hyperbole. When you conquer someone, when you conquer someone, whether you've beaten their army or driven off, driven them off the land, you describe it in language that sounds like complete extermination of everything that lives, even though that's not what you did. It's not lying. You're not lying when you say my team slaughtered them. You're using a literary device, right? You're not, you're, you're not trying to convey to the people around you that the Pittsburgh Steelers actually went and chopped up the, the Baltimore Ravens. You're not trying to convey that. The other people around you know what you mean when you say that kind of thing, right? Well, guess what? If all the surrounding cultures all use language the same way, namely, when you're going out to conquer someone, you describe your victory as complete annihilation, completely wiping people out and so on. Um, well, if the other groups do this, then it would make sense that biblical writers could use the same kind of literary devices. Uh, you do have the issue that the commands to wipe them out are used interchangeably with commands to drive them out of the land and even interchangeably with, with God saying that he's going to drive them out of the land slowly, little by little. That doesn't notice when God says, I'm going to drive them out of the land little, little by little. That does not sound like, hey, we're just exterminating them all. Boom, it's over. It doesn't sound like that. So how do you reconcile these? Well, that's one way of reconciling, reconciling them. And then again, you, you do have the issue of every all the groups that are said to be just completely wiped out. They're all around again later in massive numbers. So the question is, why are these groups that were completely wiped out around again later? Unless people are using language in a way that... We just don't use it anymore. So one possibility is the claims to completely go out and exterminate these groups, kill everyone. Um, the, uh, the, the people of the time understood what these meant, and it doesn't mean what they sound like to us. Uh, that's one interpretation. Um, is that the correct one? No, but you know, you could reconcile, you could try reconciling them in other ways. Um, so anyway, that's my point. But anyway, what would any of this have to do with the topic at hand, which is the Trinity in the Old Testament? So Stephanas, I'm sorry, but that is the most attention we will ever be able to give you again. Um, for those of you who haven't noticed, <clears throat> every single time, whenever we are trying to do a topic, we say, hey, here's the topic we're going to do. And we have some people who come in there and do everything they can to divert us from the topic. Now, notice the actual topic. It seems pretty relevant, right? Because if you talk to Muslims, Muslims generally believe, hey, uh, it's Islam that's consistent with the Old Testament view of God. And so Christians have obviously have a distorted view of God. Well, if, if the Old Testament proclaims a plurality within the one God, let alone a trinity, then it's Islam that's the odd man out here. And so this would seem to be a very relevant topic. If Christians are claiming that God is triune, 
And we can actually look to the Old Testament and see, is, is that the case? Can we, see, um, can we see information about this even in the Old Testament? Notice why that's important. Um, people want to say, hey, the doctrine of the Trinity was invented in the fourth century. Really, really stupid. Um, but wherever you want to put it, if you want to say, no, this doctrine was invented in the fourth century, this, this doctrine was invented in the third century, or this doctrine was invented by the Apostle Paul, wherever you're pinning this doctrine and saying, this is where it came up. If the doctrine is actually much earlier, or you can find hints of it much earlier, that seems relevant. And so, wow, imagine a situation where we try to get to the truth of these matters. We try to look deep into our beliefs to see how they cohere, whether they fit together well. We look at the evidence and imagine the life of some of the people who just say, hey, these guys are trying to get to the truth. How do I want to spend my life distracting them and diverting their attention to something else as much as possible? What do you think about people like that, Anthony? I think they must be followers of Allah. Uh, <laughs> but I did want to say before we conclude, uh, I've been thinking this in my head while you were talking, while he was rambling. No, I'm kidding. Uh, uh, the, the thing that we're just sort of letting slide here is the assumption that Jews didn't interpret the Old Testament this way. And that's something we'll tackle in the videos, or I'll tackle in the videos. Uh, and so I want to throw out some resources for you guys, if uh, for those that are interested. Uh, one is a book by Daniel Boyerin called Borderlines, the Partition Between uh, Ju Judaism and Christianity. And in that book, uh, Daniel Boyerin, is a, he's an Orthodox Jew who's a scholar of Jewish studies. He's, he's a Talmudic scholar. He argues that ancient Jews prior to the Talmudic rabbis Prior to the Jews who had an axe to grind, uh, he, he points out that uh, uh, they actually had a belief that was uh, analogous to what Christians believe regarding God. They, they thought of God as existing in a multi-personal way. And what's most interesting is one of the ways they referred to one of those persons is as the word. Uh, in Aramaic, it's memra. In Greek, it's logos. That's the term that John uses for Jesus. Uh, and Memra was also, by the way, a way of referring to the angel of the Lord. Some, in some of the passages that mention the angel of the Lord, the ancient Jewish targums, the, the paraphrases of the Old Testament, use the phrase Memra as a way of denominating him or referring to him. And so, uh, you know, the idea that Jews didn't believe this, that I'm somehow uh, blaspheming when I say this, or any of those kinds of things is, is just wildly out of touch with uh, with scholarship. And I think that's why, you know, you get these people that want to focus on, uh, you know, Old Testament wars or something mm -hmm. like that. Also because of the embarrassment, right? The embarrassment that Islam is very clearly a religion <coughs> of violence. And it's, it's embarrassing to, to compare that to Christianity, where Christ, uh, you know, instead of slaughtering people, laid down his life for people. And then tells his followers to to do so as well. Oh, if 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 that had been a Muslim, which I don't know, oh yeah, I, I would have answered that totally differently. I would have, I would have just I would have uh, I would have just shown what the Quran says about the inspiration, uh, preservation, and authority of the Old Testament scriptures. And so, if he's complaining about it, then uh, I would have some interesting issues here. All right, a uh, couple. Gosh, I really want to cut off, but there are some uh, quick responses here. Uh, Abdul Rahman says, why don't you attribute that logic to Surah Tauba? <laughs> so that's Surah 9 of the Quran. This is where you have the, oh. the commands to fight those who do not believe in Allah, um, to violently subjugate Jews and Christians until they pay you money. Um, this is where you have fight those, um, uh, fight the unbelievers who, who are near to you and let them find in you hardness. And so he's saying, why don't we attribute that the, the same reasoning I just applied to the, you know, the conquest of, of, of the Canaanites and so on. Why don't I apply the same uh, reason? Well, here's the thing. If you had, if you, if you were to give us evidence that, that there, that this is a figure of speech and is not to be understood literally, then I would, right? Like when Muslims say, uh, like people like Shabir Ali, his, his position on the, on the age of Aisha being nine is that it was a figure of speech that you say, hey, she was nine. And that was just a way of saying I was young, but she could have been like 18 or 20 or something like that. She, it's just an exaggeration or something like that. Now, I don't believe that. The reason I don't believe that is because there's no evidence for it, right? I can't find, I can't, we don't see anyone else using this, this figure of speech. So if you're going to claim it's a figure of speech, I have no problem with that. 
but you'd have to give some evidence. When we look at the the, the commands in uh, in Surah 9 of the Quran to go out and fight and violently subjugate, that's exactly how Muhammad interpreted that. That's exactly how all four of the rightly guided caliphs interpreted that. So if I'm going to go with some other interpretation, where do I go? Right? Muhammad is the greatest interpreter of the Quran. He could he interpreted those to mean he needs to violently subjugate the entire world. Right? So that's Muhammad's view. I have nowhere else to go. So if I had reasons to think that this is, you know, that I need to reinterpret that, then that would be one thing, right? When we talk about, you know, the conquest of Canaan, the, the fighting the Amalekites, the fighting the Midianites and so on, do we have some reason to think that something is going on here? Yes, as I pointed out, you, the commands to, uh, to wipe everything out are used interchangeably with drive them off the land. That should, that should immediately say, wait a minute, something's going on here. We need, to, we need to figure, we need to solve this little riddle. When all the groups that are said to be wiped out are around later, that should immediately signal you to say, wait a minute, maybe something's going on here. Maybe they're, maybe they're using literary devices that we don't really use. When you look at the surrounding cultures and you see them using the same exact literary device, they will describe a military victory as complete annihilation of a people. Then we should, we should be thinking, wait a minute, maybe something is going on here. So the difference, so the reason I don't apply the same logic to Surat at Talba is there's no evidence that I should apply it in Surat at Talba. If you have some, I'd be happy to look at that. All right, one last thing, then we have to have to have to close out. Sultan here says, because he's brought this up several times, what about Melchizedek? He was made in the image of the sun and doesn't have a beginning and an end. Does that mean he is in the godhood? <clears throat> Um, I'm going to go ahead and give my response here. Uh, let me just read this for you real quick. Um, cause I think this is my, I'd, I'd be interested in Anthony's view here. Uh, my view is that's not what the author of Hebrews is doing at all. He's not saying that Melchizedek is divine. He's not saying that this, this is a divine person. He's not saying that he literally has no beginning or end. That's my view. If Anthony has a different one, that'd be, uh, be interested in hearing that. But if you look at, um, Hebrews, he's presenting a problem here, namely in the old Testament, the Jews had a priesthood, the Levitic priesthood, but they're told that the priesthood of the Messiah is going to be after the order of Melchizedek. So the question is, why, why isn't it the 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 why isn't the the Messiah after the priesthood of the order of 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 the Levites and not after Melchizedek, right? And I mean, why is it Melchizedek? So he puts this he puts this forward in uh, chapter seven of the book of Hebrews. It says now, if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of the uh, of it the people received the law. What further need was there for another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek, and not be designated according to the order of Aaron? So he's presenting this as a uh, as an issue. Why is that? Why is the Messiah a priest after the order of Melchizedek? Right. He's trying to figure this out. Now, I learned this in a class on Judaism, which was taught by a rabbi. He starts talking about, he started uh, telling us about how the rabbis who took the, the Old Testament very, very seriously, who took their scriptures very seriously, would try to understand um, messages that God was giving them. Right? You have all these situations of, of parallels in the Old Testament where it would say one thing and then it would say the same thing in different words. He said the rabbis would meditate on these, on these two parallels because they believed that God was giving them a message in there, that people who really loved the scriptures we're going to sit there and say, wait a minute, God's not just God's not just going to repeat himself for no reason. There's a message there. And if you love the scripture enough, God is going to reveal you something new. He's going to reveal something that's been hidden there um, because it's there for the people who really love the scripture and meditate on the scripture. Right. So get, that's what the author of Hebrews is doing throughout the entire book of Hebrews. Right. He's meditating on all these things in the law and the Old Testament, seeing what they reveal about the Messiah. Now, what he does here, what he does, again, this, this is how I'm interpreting this, um, again, based on a, a rabbi explaining to us how Jews would interpret the Old Testament. That's what you have here, right? You have a person who is very, very familiar with the Old Testament, learning, uh, trying to understand from the Old Testament things about the Messiah, right? So using this method, this is how he would do it. He would say, okay, we have here a Levitic priesthood, but... The scripture says that the Messiah is going to be a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Why would he say that? What sense does it make? Well, using this method that God has sort of hidden these truths in there for people who love the scripture, the method would be, okay, we're going to take what we know about Melchizedek. We're going to lay it beside what we know about Levi. 
and the Levitic priesthood. We're going to put these things side by side and we're going to compare them. And somehow in the comparisons of things that we know in their descriptions, that's God telling us something about the Messiah. That's God revealing something to us about the Messiah. So he does this and say, okay, what do we know about Levi? What do we know about Moses? What do we know about Aaron? Well, we have, well, let me go ahead and read the passage. So uh, Hebrews 7, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high God, who met Abraham as he was returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham apportioned a tenth part of the spoils, was first of all, by the translation of his name, notice he's looking, what, what do the names mean? Well, he's, looking for, he's looking for coded information here. By the translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem. Now, you, you need to pay attention to that, right? Because names can mean all kinds of things. It, it's, it's weird to take someone's name and just say, oh, this is, this is telling me something about this person's identity. That's not what he's doing here. He's saying, this is telling me something about the Messiah. Right? So he's comparing, he's comparing the two, and he's taking this information, and he's saying, this is telling me something about the Messiah. So he says, um, by the translation of his name, King of Righteousness, so the Messiah is going to be the King of Righteousness, and then also King of Salem, which is King of Peace. So he's the King of Salem, that's a place. But he's drawing out of this King of Peace. Why? Because he's looking, God is giving us a message through all of this. So he's the King of Peace. Notice, Jesus is the King of Peace, the Messiah is the King of Peace. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, he remains a, per, a priest perpetually. Notice, made like the Son of God. I'm not saying he is the Son of God. He remains a priest perpetually. So notice what he does there. Again, according to the way I'm interpreting this. His method is, hey, God's saying it's a priest after this order, not after this order. Why? Why? Well, in not telling us, he's inviting us to go to the Scriptures and figure out something about the Messiah. So what do we do here? Put Melchizedek, the, 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 the priesthood of Melchizedek, beside the Levitic priesthood, compare them. Whatever the differences are, that's telling us about the Messiah. That's giving us information about the Messiah. So what are the differences? Well, with Moses, with Aaron, with Le we have the genealogy. We have no genealogy with Melchizedek. We know the meaning of the names. What's his name mean? It's king of righteousness. What is he? He's the king of Salem, so Jerusalem. Uh, what's that telling us? He's the king of peace. He's the king of righteousness. We have no genealogy for, for him. So with these other guys, we know their fathers and mother. With, with uh, Melchizedek, we don't know his father and mother. Right? We, don't, we have no genealogy. What is this telling us? This is telling us that the Messiah is actually something greater. The Messiah is, it, it, he, he, he's eternal, right? He's not just an ordinary human being. So he draws all of this information out because he's looking for kind of hidden messages, coded information, that God has left there, placed in there for people who love the scriptures to learn truths about the Messiah. And he goes just based on the text, pulling out all of these things. And then he's saying, and look, that, that is Jesus. That's, that's, that's who this is. So that's my understanding of what's going on there. So is he saying, no, Melchizedek, he's a son of God too. He's part of the Godhead too. No. What possible basis could he, could he have for saying that? And there, there's, there's, there's no real basis for saying that um, in, in the text. This is, he's, he's using a Jewish method, a, a, a rabbinic method of interpretation that he's applying to this um, to learn things about the Messiah. So these guys view the Old Testament, uh, the Jewish scriptures, as containing all of this straightforward information, but also all of these deep truths for people who love the scriptures. And they had methods for getting to the bottom of these things and methods for drawing out these deep truths. As far as I can tell, that's what the author of Hebrews is doing. But I don't think he's saying that 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 the uh, that Melchizedek is part of the Godhead. Godhead. That's my understanding. That's the way I've interpreted it. Anthony, am I wrong here? You are much more educated on these things than I am. I would agree with that. Uh, simply, you know, it, the way it's it's encapsulated in a nutshell is just to say that Melchizedek is a type of Christ. He is a a pointer, like so many Old Testament figures are, to the Messiah. And David's laid out the way that that emerges, you know, by laying uh, side by side Melchizedek and the Levitical priests and noting uh, relevant differences. The, the other thing is, though, that I'd point out is those who take the view that Melchizedek is a divine person, a theophany, don't end up making him a different figure from Christ himself. So there's, it's not as if there's a a fourth figure in mm -hmm. the Godhead, according to the Old Testament or the New. You would just uh, say that's, you yeah, would just say yeah. that's, that's the pre-incarnate Christ or yeah. that, that in, the spirit or something like that. Yeah. You do something like that. Right? Yeah. Either, either the son or the spirit, uh, but it wouldn't amount to a fourth person. So, uh, but it's clear that the, that Melchizedek is, uh, not a divine person according to the old Testament, but can 
function as a type of the divine person who is Christ uh, because of the these uh, uh, ways of uh, approaching the scriptures. And, th and this is not an isolated <coughs> phenomenon, right? I mean, scripture is replete, replete with this sort of thing. And it's also not, and you already pointed this out, though, but it's also not a distinctively Christian thing. This precedes uh, Christians. Jews were looking at the Old Testament scriptures as pointers or foreshadowings long before Christians were on the scene. And that's why the, the early apostles and the early Christians are engaged in this sort of thing, because that's that's the sort of thing that Jews had always been doing. And it's it, what's interesting is it's, it's not just um, later Jews who are doing this, but you find this sort of thing in the Bible itself, where where people, old, old older individuals are interpreted as types of, of later individuals. And I give you an example uh, really quickly. Uh, we're about to wrap up here, but uh, really quickly, uh, when you look at the book of Daniel, right, just think about it. You've got a Jewish youth who's in captivity to a pagan king, but because he's able, unlike other figures in the Bible that are in history that we know of, uh, he's able to interpret the dream of the king. He's exalted uh, in the in the king's uh, uh, you know service, uh, and now becomes a prominent figure with great authority throughout uh, this this pagan kingdom. Who does that sound like? I was talking to you about Daniel, right? But most uh, most of you probably recognized, and I, uh, I hope all of you did, but. Uh, uh, that that sounds a lot like Joseph, doesn't it? And so there, there's a significance there. Once you realize there's that connection, then you should start thinking uh, that, that God is probably telling you something significant uh, by doing that. And there is a, there is a significance. I'm not going to trace that out, but uh, you, you have this kind of foreshadowing taking place in the case of Daniel uh, uh, through Joseph. And all of this, of course, ultimately points to Christ, uh, whose father, by the way, is Joseph who has a number of dreams, right? Supernatural dreams. Anyways, I won't go down that whole road, but. All right, guys. I uh, just want to close out with this comment. Uh, blah, blah, blah says, thank you for your why I'm a Christian video. I fall asleep to it every single night. It's my favorite testimony. <laughs> well, Maybe the creepiest comment I've ever gotten in my life. Because that is, how do you not have nightmares? I'm talking about some horrible, horrible stuff uh, in that video. Especially if you don't get to the, 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 the nice part, right? The conversion part. What if you just fall asleep with after all the horrible things. Anyway, <laughs> glad you like it though. Um, all right, everyone. And we, we're we going to be recording tomorrow, but if we get a lot of work done during the day and we're able, we are planning again to go live again tomorrow night where we'll be taking more questions and continuing our discussion of the Trinity. All right. See you all then. God bless. <laughs>